<laughs> Good morning, everybody. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. yes, sir. After a long weekend, I hope you are rested and ready for some good stuff to take you into a pretty short week to start April. Mm. Didn't fall for any of that stupid April Fool's shit, did you? I was actually telling producer James that up until like I saw this post by Kuto Teledi, I actually uh, completely forgot that it was April Fool's. I didn't. I never pay attention to April Fool. I always think it's stupid. So it suited me down to the ground that it was on a holiday where I didn't pay right. attention to any media. Yeah. So I was like, "Good, you guys knock yourselves out with your dumb April I didn't, Fool's I nonsense." I did not see it at all. Like Non-son-son. it just didn't have it. Yeah, it is absolute nonsense. And for whatever reason, I feel like uh, more and more people are getting over it. Every day is April Fool's Day in the world right now. I mean, oh my god, am I wrong? No. I mean, like we were talking just now about like Brigitte Macron, ooh, ooh. who's the French first lady. And there's so much weird shit around that. And and if you if you go into the rabbit holes, oh, my God, you'll get sucked in. Like the more you find out, the weirder it gets. It's like there's no um, pictures of her as a young girl. None. Okay, but she is like 700 years old or whatever. Gareth, I don't care. How old is she and how old is he? Like there's a, it's a there's thirty a, year age gap or something, right? Yeah, and, and, and she was a teacher or something. There's pedophilia in the mix as well. Like I mean, <laughs> oh, like what geez. the fuck is going on? Like what is wrong with these people? <laughs> oh, so, like, and at some point, <sighs> when um, <laughs> when <laughs> the story broke, yeah, instead of just releasing <laughs> one picture of this woman as a child, they went after the people who were investigating the story. Firstly, yes. to shut it down. Yes, and then. They went even further and released a doctored <laughs> picture claiming that it was this woman as a child. But like, there's no evidence of her being her <laughs> for the first 30 years of her life. <laughs> None whatsoever. The person she claimed she had these kids with uh, before she married the French president, that person apparently is dead. Listen. Pumi is obsessed with this Kate Middleton story because that's also weird. Yeah. Uh, but but every day there's a new one. That's why I say every day is April Fool's Day, right? It's 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 lunacy. Like we we are living in, uh, I don't know. It's a revolving door of jokes on a daily basis. Like it's madness. I don't know. Is there anything that happened yesterday that anyone would have uh, found funny? Because the way that we're responding quite rightly mm. to April Fool's jokes now is the way we should be responding to all news. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't believe, I don't believe any of it until I can actually find out for myself and prove yeah. that it's real. I'm not taking any of this seriously. So I'm just thrilled it was on a public holiday and we didn't have to pay any attention. Thank God for that. And listen, this month, there's that one public holiday, but I've got good news for those of you who, like me, believe that the country is lazy and that we do not need any more holidays. Mm. And that is that April the, the 27th, Freedom Day. Which is a is Saturday. A Saturday. So yep. no days off. Mm. Mm. But you will get May the 1st. And then, of course, you got Voting Day at the end of May. Yeah. So you're going to be some of those. Some. Some, yeah. Some. So some. May the 1st is a Wednesday. But otherwise, this month of April, from now on, no more holidays. If there were ever a country in 2024 that needed to do a bit more work, it would mm -hmm. be us. Correct. It would be South Africa. On ourselves. Yep. <laughs> on our jobs. On everything. everything. Yeah. Exactly. Holistic health work. Uh, Sanele says April Fool's is for fools. Yep. Mm -hmm. And those that fall for it. Yep. Yeah. Dave mm. says we've been lied to for far too long. I didn't find yesterday's fibs to be funny. You see? This mm -hmm. is what I'm saying is people are over it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, how was your long weekend, Jack? My long weekend was fantastic. Tell me more. Um, tell me more. So I got to spend a lot of time with family, which is great. Love. And, uh, um, you know, we did uh, the, the ceremonial thing of going to the graveside to visit some of our beloved ones. Oh, is that, is, is that a, a regular annual thing at this time of year? Or is it just something um, you do when you're all together? Well, we, we do it quite often. Uh, mm. But uh, I think this time of the year just felt like the right time to do it this time around. And so we went on Sunday. And, you know, for whatever reason, like I'm not a... Uh, superstitious person or anything like mm. that but there's there's a grounding that comes with going so, so to important, dude. you know the cemetery and um just just coming to terms with the fact that at some point 
you're going to join those people. Right. And it's humility. The, yes. That's what it is. It's so, like the ultimate humility. You're like, I'm going to take control of uh, this very uncomfortable fact yep. of mortality. And I'm go. going to, I'm going to try and wrestle with it. And when you leave, you leave with an attitude of gratitude. I can tell you that much. And so, as a result, I'm floating on a cloud right now. I'm actually really pleased you brought that up because although it's a morbid thing for some people and they don't like discussing this stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I must, be a little bit black because we do this as well. I mean, when I say we, it's just really me and my parents because my brother and sister are just so disinterested in this stuff. Yeah. But we have a family graveyard, right? And there's just, um, there, there are five generations that come before me that mm. are buried there. So mm. it's, it goes back away. And if we didn't go and clean this up and tidy it up and sort it out, it would just go to rack and ruin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of places in this country where people are meant to be maintaining and looking after stuff, they have gone to rack and ruin. So yeah, they have. first of all, it's like a duty, which can be a bit of a pain. Mm -hmm. But I, I like that duty because, again, it's, it's connecting you with where you come from, yep. the people you come from, with mm -hmm. the contribution they've made to you and to the world. So you take uh, a minute to be grateful, which yeah. is what you were saying just yeah. now. And then it also reminds you that you're going to be in there one day. Mm -hmm. So don't get too ahead of your skis. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also really important because it gives you a sense of identity. These are the people I come from. Their, their blood flows in my veins. Yeah. I have a background, so I'm not too worried about having to constantly assert myself in the world, prove that I'm worthy, because mm -hmm. I've got this behind me, you know? Yep. Which is nice. And, and it's... I think that's special. It's extremely comforting as well. Um, Definitely. The, the idea that there were people on this planet that mm. fought through all of the struggles that come with life. They, they took it on head on. And, and by the way, they were, it was much tougher for them. Extremely right. tougher, yeah. extremely tougher. And they paved the way literally for you to live. And um, I always bring it up with uh, my friends that like, when you break it down to the, uh, when, when we go all the way to the molecules and all of this stuff, we are literally the physical embodiment of all of our ancestors put right. together. And it, it only makes sense for you to connect with wherever the physical body of that person was left. So yeah, correct. it's always great. No, it's always. a good thing. And, and uh, for all the reasons you've just said, I'm a big fan of the same. Yep. So Francois says he spent the weekend in KZN, also felt like a graveyard. The place needs serious attention. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was my opinion last weekend when I got back. I yeah. said um, I was very disappointed in the way that the place is looking. It does feel like it's a province that's in decline and it's falling apart. And uh, certainly the politicians are not helping. Yeah, they're not. You know, I mean, it's going to be one of the most hotly contested places in the election, which mm -hmm. is now just a month and a bit away. Yeah. You so know, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. particularly fond of King uh, Zolitini. Mm. Uh, before he passed, but I genuinely wish he was back. Yeah, you think he was a bit more of the glue that we needed? I think so. I think so. Um, uh, the king now, Mrs. Zulu, has it, it, it seems as if he doesn't have that gravitas or, no, he you know, he hasn't been in the job for very long. Yeah, but for whatever reason, when he ascended, you remember the, the chaos that, that, oh took my God, place just yeah, straight before. after when they couldn't decide on the oh succession. Oh my goodness. Family split in the half and Oy. half of them didn't want him as king, the other half did. Was, that's just a mess. And when we thought that those fires were out, then, you know, Mr. Jacob Zuma put some petrol on top of it and now. It's, no. it's ignited a different kind of yeah. flame. And, you know, if, if you had a calming voice in the midst of all of that stuff, I think a lot of things would be able to settle down. And given the fact that Uncle Posey can't tell anyone to do anything, he's not going to step in and help either. So, it is what it is. Uh, listen to these two horrible stories. Mapelo says, my uncle's grave was invaded by bees a few years ago. Now going to our family graveyard's a nightmare. Oh my goodness. You get stung by bees. Oh. And uh, Hugh says, I tried to tidy the family grave. Some new plants, gardening, clearing, etc. One week later, the new plants are stolen. Meh. Mm. <laughs> Jesus. Do you know what I mean? Oh, oh. wow. Uh, okay, so there's so much to get to. There. Because there was a lot of campaigning over the weekend. I actually saw a TV show um, yesterday. They were, they were lamenting the fact that over Easter weekend, there were so many politicians getting involved with the church. Oh, yes. 
So I, I don't know why anyone's just, you know, uh, surprised by any of this anymore. It's like, come on, guys. You know, so many of our church leaders are trying to cozy up to politicians that it shouldn't surprise you that when the politicians are a month away from voting and they need everybody to come to their side, have a literal come to Jesus moment, <laughs> that they would not pitch up at churches and do the most brazen, mm -hmm. sloppy, mm -hmm. untidy, off-putting kind of politics of all, which is to try and tie themselves to religion. I mean, yep. the least morally upstanding people in the country are almost without exception politicians. Mm. And then for them to take advantage of the most holy weekend for Christians and go around pandering to religious communities, well, I'm not surprised if you are, that's on you. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised either. Just, yeah, it's, it's exactly where I would expect them to be. It's page two of the South African political rule book. Yeah, so you, may, you, you ally yourself with one of the churches. Mm -hmm. They let you in. Mm. There's some kind of a, an exchange made, whether it's money, whether it's influence, mm. whether it's lobbying, whether it's when I need you, I'm going to call on you. You know, you see them all. I, I, I watched ENCA on... Sunday morning, mm -hmm. because I was getting ready, we were going to a family lunch. So I turn on the TV, a cup of tea, and I'm like, oh, Jesus. Like at Rayma Church, literally, Jesus. Mm -hmm. At Rayma Church, they've got, had the cameras on. Before there's anything going on there, and you see all these people pitching up in their Sunday finest. And the reason it's news is because it's, it's like in the run-up to the election. Yeah. These people are getting into the churches. I think if you are a real religious leader of any salt at all, mm. this is probably the one time you don't want those people in your churches at Easter. You could you could do what you like. I'm not going to tell any religious leader what to do. Yep. Most of them wouldn't want my my <laughs> wisdom and guidance anyway. In any case, yeah. They but... think I have nothing to add, and I don't blame them. But in this case, guys, you, you know, talk about squandering your moral capital at a time where you have Easter going on. It's a big celebration for Christians. It's an mm -hmm. important one. It's mm -hmm. a serious one. Way more important than Christmas to most Christians. Yeah. And yet this is the time you decide to let the wolf in to the sheep's lair. And when you, you think know. about how uh, fame-hungry some of these preachers are, Oof. This would have been the perfect time to say, I don't want any politicians in my church. You would have been the only I mean, one. People would have loved you for it. We they mean, would have loved you for it. I think that's the way to score, actually. If you, if you want to like increase the membership and yeah. improve the way that everybody in your community thinks of you, hmm. it is precisely that. To turn, to chase the moneylenders out of the temple. Out of, completely. And <laughs> because the Bible has got so many stories and you can quote oh, from it in different yeah. ways, you just find the right verse that goes along with not letting corrupt, uh, devious people into your church. And you just push that yeah. narrative for Easter. No, I think I just hit the one on, on the head, the, the money lenders. It's the, you know, cause always people go, Oh, Jesus was meek and mild. And I'm not a very religious person, as you know, but I know, enough, I. I know enough in the Bible to know that that story proves that he was not some meek and mild no, he wasn't. dude who, who wanted, you know, that, ugliness and corruption no. around what he was trying to get out there as a message. It's just, it's just awful. Politicians are shameless, says Sanele. Frank Gallagher, even he became a politician once, Yep. even though he was already shameless in his entire adult life. It's such a great show. Over Amazing. the weekend, I watched a TV show about money laundering at a big church. Now, oh. I'm more suspicious of every big church because it makes so much sense how money laundering would work. Well, the other thing that is completely ridiculous to me is that churches do not pay tax. Yes. Now, I know that they've tried to change this over the years, and there's some, some religious organizations who fall just short of not being you know, held accountable for paying taxes, but most of them get away with it. And I, I, again, it just seems like it, it, for, that, for that reason, it attracts some very dodgy people. Mm -hmm. um, I am absolutely a fan of tax uh, avoidance. So you shouldn't pay more tax than you absolutely have, have to. to. Yeah, yeah. Not a fan of tax evasion. Don't break the law because I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want us to. Although 
if the government does push you to a point where you no longer feel that it's appropriate to follow the law, then we should all immediately become yeah. every kind of tax avoider and evader. But um, the, the, the fact that there isn't this tax component, you can keep an extra between 25 and 45% of your income hmm. seems a major motive for some very, very crooked people to yep. go into that profession. And you can see it. There's there's yeah. a there's a very well known actor um, to protect his uh, identity. I won't mention his name, but hmm. uh, I had the opportunity to have a chat with him uh, back in his hometown, and he told me he was like, "Look, man, if I didn't get into acting, I'd just be a preacher." Yeah. I'm like, "Okay, that, yeah, yeah. wait, right. that kind of makes sense because you'll be able to make your money. It's somewhat of a performance art for some of these people, and you know." You, you'd get a, a, a nice stage to perform every Sunday. Sure. And, the, you know, these kind of things are the reason why a lot of people shy away from religion. It's got nothing to do with the religion itself. Mm. It's just how people choose to interpret it and use it as a weapon to get whatever things that they want. And my biggest problem with churches is the fact that there's not too many of them that actually help the people they so they claim yeah, right. they are for exactly right. Right, yeah. you've got these mega churches and homeless people sleeping right outside. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there's this room for them to sleep to have a roof over their heads. You've got people that donate north of ten thousand rand every Sunday, yeah. and yet there's no money for some starving people out there. Right, that's problematic for me. And then you add on top of that that they don't they don't get taxed. Yeah. Ah, man. Uh -huh. Ah. Uh, we will. We will see. Um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, I didn't want to turn this into a, a, a morning uh, rant, but there we go. It's something that I saw mm. quite a lot of of that happening over the weekend. These politicians. So I saw the end of e tolls has finally been signed, sealed, delivered. So again, this is amazing, and I, I don't make too little of this because I do believe, first of all, huge credit, massive. The the lion's share of the credit must mm. go to Alta. Yep. The organization undoing tax abuse. I bumped into Wayne Duvenag the other day at uh, the airport. And I said to him, well done. You've been at the forefront of this. He's become a an upstanding crusader for all the right things about civil disobedience yep. and fighting corruption in a real way. I mean, the Alta is one of the organizations that I consider worthy of your donation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You talk about the church taking a tithe. I mean, you could give these guys 100, 200 rand a month and it would be money well spent. Yep. They fight for genuinely good causes. They help poor people. They help ordinary citizens. They will stand up and they will defend you. If you've contributed even 50 rand to them, Yeah. they will defend you should Sanrel come after you for etols. No, not a thing, but it could have been. Mm -hmm. And so on. So well done to them. Uh, massive, massive credit to Arta. But I see that Gauteng motorists can finally breathe a sigh of relief. Funny, I got a an etol bill. I hadn't had one from when they instituted it. And mm -hmm. then I got one six months after that. And then nothing until maybe two months ago. Yeah. And I suddenly got this 80,000 Rand one. I'm like, ah, you think I'm going to pay that? You're insane. Good luck with that, buddy. Anyway, ETELs are finally coming to an end. Gauteng Premier Panyaza de Sufi has finalized an agreement with the finance minister and the transport minister to de-link ETELs from gantries. This will come into effect on the 11th of April, effectively ending urban ETOLing in Gauteng. The power of the people. Yep. This is not something to be made light of. People of Gauteng stood up and said, forget it. Yeah. You already get enough of our money, you crooks. Mm -hmm. You're not getting a single cent more. Yep. And we won. We won. It, Don't let Panyazala Sufi take credit, credit for, for this. No, 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 no. Don't let any of the government officials who've been fighting supposedly on your behalf, because they haven't. They haven't. For all. this, none of them, not one politician, you as an ordinary citizen who refused to pay this. And by the way, those people who did pay, and who said, oh, no, but someone's going to pay for the roads. We've got to do this. Well, you were wrong. You were. And you've got to now swallow humble pie. Yeah. It's because you screwed up. And, it is and, and, so and stop being such a do-gooder when everyone around you knows that you're just throwing really good money after bad. 
Yeah, and yeah. like, how were these things not a problem to you if you were driving on the N1 between Joburg and Pretoria and came across four of these things? You know, like how, how is that not a problem for you? So how is it going to work for me? For example, I go through one, two, three of them. Three of them on a normal morning in, three of them on the way back. And that would have come to, I don't know, 80, 100 rand a day. Can Ex you imagine? Extra. Can you imagine? Extra. I think that, that was the early calculations. So it just wouldn't have been sustainable. Oh, no. Hell no. Um, but you know what? We won. That's all you need to know. Yes. Um, three issues that South Africa needs to address to boost the economy. So these, um, I hate consultant, consulting agencies, consultancies. I hate them because they, they really are just doing the job of people who can't do the job they've got the title for. Mm. So like if you're the CEO of a company and you need seven consultants to help you, you're not the CEO of the company. No. You should resign. They should hire a CEO who can do that job. You should fire the consultants. Mm -hmm. hmm? Yeah, sounds right? that makes sense. Because why pay? Order. Why pay a CEO who's clearly not able to make the decisions? That's why they need the consultants. Mm -hmm. And pay a team of consultants. We know from State Capture how all of those consulting firms, mostly McKinsey and those sorts of guys, yeah. sent teams of people, chalked up hundreds of millions of rands in fees. Mm -hmm. And did nothing to make it better and everything to make it worse. worse yep. They were enablers mm -hmm. of state capture. This is not even a controversial thing to say anymore. No. And yet we have government, businesses, parastatals, all three of those categories that are hiring these consultants left, right, and center. They, they should be fired. Or at least the CEOs that, they, that they're doing the work for should be fired. Because we can't afford to pay for both. No. And we shouldn't be paying for bad. Mm -mm. And clearly, the consulting firms have not covered themselves in glory, so they're not the good. You know, it, it actually makes me wonder how, how, how possible is it that they've gotten this far with it? Yeah. Like, are, 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 because people are, are there, stupid. Are there that many companies that are just inept at... Yeah. Getting things done. It's not that they're inept. There are a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason is that they put people in CEO and, and other important executive positions who are incapable of making the decision. So they're doing window dressing. Okay. They're doing that because of BEE and affirmative action. Uh. And instead of going after and finding the really talented black people that they could put into those positions, they go, nah, we'll put in someone that we know who's been here for a long time. And we'll give them consultants to buffer their lack of experience. It's part of the problem. The other oh. problem is that there are just not enough brilliant people to run brilliant companies in this country because a lot of our best brains have fled. Mm -hmm. And the ones who are here are so expensive and in demand, black and white, mm -hmm. that they are outrageously expensive. So you can't afford them. That's, I think, the limitations that are placed upon certain uh, companies, especially in the private sector. Uh, as far as the the way they go about hiring people, like you just mm. mentioned BEE and all of this stuff. I I wish there could be some sort of, uh, I don't know, a report of some sorts where we look at the introduction of BEE up until right now and actually genuinely mm. look at whether or not it was a force for good or bad. Because incompetence. I don't care who it is. I think we, well, we talked about this last week. I don't, when think the DA... the, I don't think the jury's out anymore. I really think it's, it's like it's happened. We've already seen the result of this. What it has done, in, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be as, as blunt as I can here. It's probably going to get me into trouble, but that wouldn't be anything new either. Right. Uh, it's proven two things. It's proven, number one, that... It is a colossal disaster in terms of bringing new talented people into the world of business mm -hmm. and putting them through their paces and, and, and churning out proper, capable leadership. There are obviously some rare exceptions who've, despite the system, made it. And I'm talking about really talented black people who've worked extremely hard yeah. and have got to the top and have fought their way through it and have proven that they could handle all the pressure and everything else at the top of this. And remember, business is not for sissies. So no, it's I'm not saying everybody should. I'm not saying I could. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying a lot of uh, people of any background or resources or capabilities or talents might be able to do that. But what it's also done is it's 
created this, this horrible and ugly preconceived notion, which really good black people have to break every time they go into the office, which is, oh, you just got there because you're black. Right. So it's created a whole new level of insecurity, of, of dishonesty, mm. and of, of, of people having to prove themselves every day instead of just being accepted for the position that they've taken because they truly are good at that, that job. Um, I know... I, I'm, I'm certainly, I can't name them. I wouldn't want to do that to them. It would be embarrassing. But I know so many good people who, despite the fact that they've got a job and that they've earned that on their own merits, mm -hmm. are constantly having to fight everyone else in business. Because you're in meetings with other people that you've never met every other day. And, and then they get underestimated just because they are good and they are black. Mm. Um, and people go, well, they must have got that job because of BE. They must have got that job because of affirmative action. So you've undermined those people before they've even started. And these are the good ones. Mm -hmm. So we won't even talk about the shitty people who get into those positions because they probably deserve to be uh, underestimated. Yes. But the good ones, they don't deserve this. They don't. And it's, it's almost as if in some weird twist of fate, uh, the ANC government... Uh, led to black people being undermined the mm. way that they were during apartheid. That's right. And when you remember what Nelson Mandela said, if the ANC government does to you what right. the apartheid government did to you, do to the, them. them what, what we did to the apartheid, apartheid government. government. And I hope people are waking up to this fact. Uh, I hope more and more people realize that the legislation in this country has done more to bring us apart and keep us down than mm -hmm. it has to uplift us. These people celebrating the fact that there's more than 19 million people on social grants is trash. Uh, them, even Panyaza Lusufi trying to act like this Etolls thing was the idea is trash. Or being told things like unemployment is, de is decreasing, but or uh, unemployment is increasing, but increasing at a decreasing rate. Like who, what does that even mean? You're talking to like, you, you, you're you trying to bamboozle people because you assume that they're completely stupid. So and maybe you're right, but that's still no way to treat your voters. No, I, I don't. You, it is absolute. It's absolutely disgusting when you think about some of the short term and long term effects of the idiocy that came from the governing party up until sure. this point. Like they've they've made politics to devolve into a name calling mm. uh cat fight essentially it's like there's there's these kids in a playground that just can't get along and instead of an adult walking into the room and pulling them apart and saying this is how we're going to do things mm -hmm. people are just allowed to run around and go crazy it's madness well to go back to the consultants for a second because yeah. uh, that's how I, I got into my rant and you went into yours um so PwC one of these consulting firms has said that they've got they've identified they've got s uh, some spare time on their hands identified three key, key areas South Africa needs to boost the economy do you want to hear what these are mm. i mean you need a whole consulting firm to work these out the first one is government in institutions are inefficient well done. You want a naughty badge for that? I wonder what that cost them to figure out. The report says these factors make it difficult for businesses to operate and hinder overall productivity. The second challenge is a logistics crisis. Hmm. This refers to areas and issues like unreliable transport and infrastructure problems, make it expensive and time-consuming to move goods around the country. Hmm. Again, anyone who's been in traffic knows this to be true. Anyone with a pulse, really. Uh, the third one is the importance of human capital. South Africa needs a skilled and educated workforce to compete in a global economy. We were just talking about that. So yeah. I think, uh, you guys, thank you, PwC, for that excellent report. You could have saved your money. Um, just listen to what Jack and I said moments before I revealed the answers to your study and you saved yourself some trouble. Hey Amen. Why don't you pay Jack and I to uh, sit and... You know, help your consultants. It would, it would actually be a better use of your money. And to the people that are tuning in right now, if you ever felt like what you're doing is useless, just read what PwC came up with here. Yeah. 
Don't worry. Right. You, exactly. you are actually adding value to this country. Don't worry. Yeah. Hmm? So Propagenda wants to know, what will the gantries be used for now? They'll be used to track and trace probably their initial intention. Well, good luck to them. Yeah, I mean, we'll just, you know what this is going to do? Again, if they have some nefarious purpose for the gantries, and I don't believe they do because it costs money to run them, and if they're not making money out of them, I don't see why they would run them. Yeah, uh, They're not that keen on being a surveillance state. You can get away with anything in this country. We already know that. There's mm. no law enforcement. Mm. Uh, we, how many years later, Senzo you are we still can't find the person who pulled oh. the trigger. Uh, we still don't know exactly what happened with AKA, and there still. are a thousand other cases. So yep. don't get ahead of yourself on this. Uh, just relax, Propagenda. Um, I love Sanele says and Sanele says I'm going to Australia the white people can stay I'm leaving <laughs> Christopher Hendricks says the government put their negative energy into this country and, and, this, and cause unnecessary conflict among our people well, yeah that's it right. that is it I mean even if you look at the US right now that's exactly what they're trying to do yeah, and, and Carl says uh, one of the inadvertent consequences of BE was that it forced ambitious white people to start their own businesses because they hit the ceiling in corporate. More wealth in whites' hands. No one talks about this. Again, so, Very so you, you, you wanted to make BE a thing. What you've done is made a whole lot of white people go into their own businesses where they don't re rely on government or corporate policies or any of that. That shit. is a very interesting so, perspective. I've never thought point. of it that way. Very good, very good point, Carl. Uh, okay, uh, then we've got some uh, Bitcoin maximalists in the conversation here talking about how if the ANC wins, your best option is to adopt the strongest asset in the world, save your wealth away from the round, adopt Bitcoin, take it in self-custody. All right, fine, fair mm -hmm. enough, calm down. Uh, we've been talking about that for years. And yes, if you, if you have been investing in Bitcoin, it's not been a bad couple of years for the it last hasn't. two or three. Mm -hmm. But before that, it was hell. Yep. We won't forget those crashes that made people so uncomfortable. Yep. But on the whole, yes, you're right. And I'm not going to get into a whole discussion of Bitcoin. Marpello says, you never spoke about the fact that Julius Malema told his supporters to go and have more children. He's going to double the social grant. What an asshole, oh. says uh, Marpello. Oh, well. <sighs> I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, how, how? I have nothing to say does, about does, it. Does, I really don't. You know, sometimes I wish I could just call these people out. And be on some, you know what? J just once, legit sit down and explain exactly how you're going to make that happen. Like we, step we had, by uh, step. We had Brett Heron from the Good Party yes. in here on Thursday last mm -hmm. week. Don't know if you listened. Yeah, I did. And he's got big ideas of what he's going to do with other people's money. Mm. And he has no idea of how to get more of that money other than just taking it off of people at the barrel of a gun, which is what tax is. Yep. And he's got all kinds of plans to do job creation, which again is something, there is no government in the world that can make job creation a thing. What they can do is get out of the way and make the, law, make the laws that will make it easier for people to do whatever economic activity it is that they can do that is beneficial and creates you know, value. It blows my mind. It still blows my mind till this day that you still have political parties walking around saying we're going to create jobs. It's not your job to create jobs. No. <laughs> it's no. not. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, oh, man. So um, we have the result of liberation policies instead of policy politics, which is being stoked by elite business. Those people happen to be white, but that's got fuck all to do with it. Well, we know that business in this country is so craven and complicit mm. that they're in they're the they're best friends with uh, the ANC so yeah su surprised it suits them to have things going this way it does uh, paul says i hear sanrell's having a sale of purple christmas lights <laughs> <laughs> that's nice get them now half price half price yeah very very good oh my goodness i don't know what else to say about that let's move on to something else Expect. I love the way that government now says to us, you know, like those signs that say hijacking hotspot. You know those? Yeah, ones? yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're not going to police this problem. <laughs> we're not going to save you from the hijackers, you pathetic people, citizens that uh, we're meant to care about. But yeah, just be aware there could be hijackers. Like here. just here, this corner here. Yes. There's, there's, it could just happen. A friend of mine sent me the longest voice note in history yesterday. It was like eight minutes long. She, Jesus. No, she, she did. She put a podcast together. Yeah. She sent this to a whole lot of her friends. But they were usually entertaining, so I listened to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Plus, I was going around the house, switching off lights, doing stuff. So, 
You had a bit of time to kill. She um, she had this incident over Thursday night, I think, where she and her husband were in bed together and, and they woke up at two in the morning and there was a guy looking into their bedroom. Some... Just vagrant. looking into... like was, like moved the curtain. He was looking into their bedroom at two in the morning. It's obviously some wall jumper guy who was looking for an opportunity to steal something. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I mean... What a horrible thing to wake up to. And Terrible. you know, makes me think hijacking hotspot. Sorry, we're the government of this country. We can't actually enforce the laws. We won't actually look after you. We no longer have, as Ramon Kabanak said on the show some time ago, we no longer have a monopoly of violence. No. So now you're look to yourself. Yeah. Just be aware there could be a hijacker. Just look. Yeah, 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 yeah. They've gone a step further with water. They've said, according to a recent report, water shortages are expected to persist for the next five years. Expected to persist. Yeah. You know what it's due to? Yeah, they're already looking for something to blame. Delays in the Lesotho <laughs> Highlands water project. Doesn't of this course. sound like power stations that haven't been built yes, on time? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. right. mm. There's a glimmer of hope, they say. The government is taking action to address the situation. Oh, good. I feel so confident. You remember what, what the, uh, uh, a few, I think it was, yeah, it was in January. Yeah. There was that clip of Uncle Bozzi saying, we have addressed the situation. Meaning in their minds, they've dealt with it. No, just they, they had a by talking They had a conversation. It. Just the conversation means that we have addressed it. So they've announced a series of new state-owned water resources agencies. Okay, great. The agency's goals are to improve water delivery infrastructure maintenance throughout the country. So while Gauteng residents may face water challenges in the coming years, the government is working on solutions for a more sustainable water future. Watch them blame climate change when everything else falls apart. Yes. And I they'll mean, say, oh, it's God in the weather. No. It's God's fault that we don't have water people. Because you see, you can't blame him for electricity provision because no. he's not actually involved in ESCO. At all. But when water doesn't fall from the sky, you can always blame climate change and God. It's just the I ultimate mean, get out of jail free card, isn't it? It is. And and <laughs> the, the the condescension oh, yes, yes. in how they tell us these things. Like you can expect it for the next five years. Wow. Five, five years. Like five years, yeah. Get ready. So you're telling me you're basically not gonna do shit for the next five years. Yeah. That's what you say. Mm -hmm. Don't expect your water to be clean or coming out of your tap mm -mm. for the next five years. That's what they've said. Uh, anyone who sends a voice note over two minutes must be unfriended, says Carl. No, come on. Come on, Carl. You come know what? I'd sometimes, uh, listen, have you ever had a, con a phone conversation with a woman? Takes a, <laughs> usually a lot longer. <laughs> with your friends, with your, uh, if you're a guy, uh, you speak to another guy on the phone. Hey, what's happening? Yeah, all right. I'll see you half past one. Yeah. Go. Ciao. Bye-bye. With, with women. Oh. So what what are you wearing? Are you going to please make sure that you've got this? Did you leave that on top of the? But by the way, is it uh, okay? Ah. When when the phone was invented, obviously a man invented it. Mm. Obviously, so, <laughs> like, it's not again. I know what's going to happen. <laughs> we also invented something. Yeah. Sure, but the phone was invented by men. Mm. It was to convey information. Yep. Didn't take long for women to turn it into an instrument for endless communication mm -hmm. and mostly about gossip and nonsense. Yep. So, and you know, just the, saying, ir the irony is another unfor another unforeseen uh, consequence of inventing something for men is that we now have to spend hours and hours on the, on phone, the phone or listening to voice notes that are seven minutes long. From and girls. you know, the the irony is not <laughs> beyond me that Alexander Graham Bell's wife was deaf. <laughs> you make a good point. <laughs> it really is. You make a good point. Genuinely. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> All right. Very good. Uh, I watched Napoleon, says Carl, over the weekend. Was there any reality where Josephine was actually that hot? Wow, this great movie. Well, <laughs> I haven't so, watched it yet, actually. Yeah, you've got to watch It's such a good movie. Yeah. Um, Josephine, of course, the love of Napoleon's life. And uh, she was. she just treated him so badly. She cheated on him. Mm. constantly you know you'd think being emperor of the french uh, and a great general and uh and a man who just i mean he really turned the world on its head after his con wars of conquest and yeah you know, changed the face of europe forever mm -hmm. wiped out the oldest empire on that continent and yet 
<laughs> his, his woman just she, she was held, like she what held him? him in the palm of her hand yeah but she was uh, to him she was the most beautiful woman ever Josephine Beauharnais mm -hmm. um, he basically adopted her children from another man as his own and he was devoted to her yeah um, eventually a lot like uh, Nelson and Winnie she became a bit ungovernable okay and also she didn't provide him with the air that he wanted like Henry VIII believed it was all always the woman's fault. So she had to go, and then he married a, 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 a different woman. Mm. And um, she was a, an Austrian princess, I think. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, it didn't, it didn't all end uh, very well for, for either of them, but he did, I think she was on his mind right at the end of his life. Yeah. He said, France, the army, Josephine. I'm not, not necessarily in that order. But those were the three things that were going through his mind when he died. Yeah, so yeah, yes, yeah. he was obsessed with her to the end. That's that's pretty intense. Mm. That is a love story written by real people, okay? None of this Disney yeah. nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like and sometimes full it of doesn't, tough yeah. trials and tribulations. And, sometimes it doesn't all come together. And usually it's the man who's unfaithful. In this case, it was the woman. Mm. Uh, there was a lot made in the movie of you know the fact that there was this kind of this bizarre, almost bondage S and M <laughs> part of that. We don't know that for a fact, but yeah. we do know his letters to her were pathetic. I mean, this was a man who really uh, was he like the moon and the stars and my. No, it was worse than that. He was like craving her acceptance and her correspondence. Uh -huh. and her, we talk about how men share information, mm -hmm. but in this case, he just wanted her to communicate so badly with yeah. him, and it it was not. Uh, and not, she was like, what have you done for me, Nick? Yeah. Like, what's the, she didn't even reply to his letters. Oh, my God. Yeah. He's, busy, he's busy conquering Italy and she's uh, busy cavorting around Paris with other men. Right. So that's why I always <laughs> point it out. Like when, whenever I get stuck in one of those men are trash conversations, <laughs> yeah, I'm well, like, look, okay. people are can, trash. Can go both ways. It, it, man, people are trash. Period. So listen to this quickly. Uh, Debbie says, and this is, I'm not very familiar with this story, but apparently something worked well in how to be a sport. Have a peek at the Madi Beng, our municipality who manages our area. They get 72 million rand a month from people and not one cent goes to how to be a sport community. We have estates which don't get a great service, a few meters of road, no refuse, no water, electricity, etc. but every person pays rates. Um, so what happened there? Tell me the, tell me the story of hmm. how it all went down after that. Yeah, I imagine if... They in Hartis. I don't think they were burning tires oh, and all of that well, stuff. Let me tell you that that dam is such a disaster with that water hyacinth. You, you can't. Mm -hmm. It's disgusting. And, and, and you know, like it's it it makes it seem as if everyone is blind to the stuff because seemingly no one wants to step up and do something about it. Or are we too invested in ourselves and making sure that our it's lives too, are okay? It's, it's too. The problem is too hard to solve. And people don't have the ability to solve small or big problems anymore. Mm. They just don't. That's why if, if you find someone in your life, whether it's a husband, a wife, a business partner, a service provider, to be as general as possible, like a plumber, electrician who can solve problems, who can mm -hmm. really fix things. You got a leak in the roof, the guy comes around, he fixes the leak in the roof. Oh, I'll pay whatever it costs. Right. I'm happy to just find someone who can solve a problem. Right. It's like no one solves big problems anymore. When last was a dam built? I don't even know. I genuinely can't even tell you. You know, South Africa hasn't built a dam in ages. We hear about this Lesotho Highlands water project, but guys, it's not, there are no new dams being no. built. No. I mean, I learned about this uh, Lesotho Highlands project when I was in primary school. Yeah, and it, they just started it then. Yeah. Oh. So you can imagine. 20 years no. was just too long for them to keep it running. Well, let us uh, turn our attention away from these things now and get to some African analysis with uh, JJ Cornish for this morning, which is brought to you by the Johannesburg Business School, looking at what's happening around the African continent. It's always a pleasure to spend some time with JJ Cornish. Bonjour, JJ. Bonjour. You want problems? I'll give you problems. <laughs> no, we come to you for uh, the opposite. We come for to solutions. you solutions. You no, know, we come to you for stories about what what's working in in Africa. Come on. <laughs> well, I haven't got terribly much today, and uh, I say that 
with alarming frequency, I'm afraid. But uh, I think I have one of the better bouquets uh, in terms of interest that I've ever okay. had. So it's it's going to be some day. You know, I don't know, where do you want to start, with Sudan? Let's start with Sudan and South Sudan. So that's South Sudan, of course, the, um, the, the, the youngest country in the world, and Sudan once Africa's largest country before they split in half. Um, what's been happening in there since then? Well, of course, you know, they seceded, or South Sudan was allowed to secede. The African mm. Union didn't allow uh, pre former colonies to change their borders. But this was 2011, and the largest country then, South Sudan left because of a long, long-running civil war. Uh, it, it really was a black versus Arab thing, and they don't like to talk about it as that, but it really was. And uh, they, they got the oil at South Sudan. Sudan seemed to move ahead, to, and, and when they got rid of Omar al-Bashir, they things worked seemed to be working towards a democratic solution. Then the army, with uh, uh, the rapid support forces, took on the army. And uh, they've been fighting now for a year, 8 million people displaced, um, and, and, and they're on the verge of famine. There are no <laughs> online remittances going into Sudan, and, and many of the African countries work on those, live on those, because of connectivity problems. They can't send remittances into South Sudan. Prices are soaring. There are cereal production cuts. There is a humanitarian disaster there now. Uh, children are dying of hunger uh, as the famine takes hold. Adults are not buying medicine so that they can buy food. And, and the problem, it, it means that Abdul Fattah al-Buran, the army chief, and Hameti, the uh, rapid support forces chief, both believe they can win this war. And that is the real problem. Mm -hmm. Military men, as long as they believe they can win, won't talk peace. Uh, we have Mukhtar Atif, who runs the emergency response rooms. He gives a single meal to 45,000 people a day. Uh, he has 70 community kitchens in Khartoum. But they rely on donations. And because of the mobile banking apps that are not working, they can't get those. So he's had to close down many of his operations. 25 million people, that's half the population of Sudan, need food aid to survive. And uh, that's very, very sad. Not much better in the South, though, Gareth. You know, uh, they, they, <clears throat> there are acute levels of violence there because of insecurity. A key pipeline, the oil from South Sudan goes through Sudan, through Port Sudan, in fact, to the rest of the world. And uh, uh, when things don't work in Sudan, it affects South Sudan's oil movement. But a pipeline that carries uh, uh, something like... Uh, ooh, uh, four fifths of the of the pipe oil out of South Sudan has been damaged. Now, South Sudan, two thirds of their oil revenues are, are affected by this, and uh, ninety percent of that country's oil revenues or or re revenues come from oil, according to the World Bank. So it's it's really sad. Uh, the shutdown of the oil well means that people are not. You know, people haven't been benefiting from oil, and uh, a lot of people yeah. in the in the, in South Sudan are saying, "Good thing that it's closed. We're not getting anything from this oil." You know, hmm. with that attitude, the, the the oil, the money from the oil is going to a narrow elite people in Juba. Salva Kiir uh, has corrupt the the president has corrupt special projects. Uh, civil servants, for example, haven't been paid in six months. Uh, the seventy seven. 7.7 7 million people, that's two-thirds of the population, are facing extreme hunger. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's a, a state collapse is very, very possible there. Savakir, surrounded by his henchmen, has no money to hold elections to oh see, you know, to, to underline. So things are looking very, very bad there. Um, the, the last production uh, halt in oil was 2012. He borrowed enough money to virtually ruined South Sudan into the future. But that money didn't go into uh, the uh, fuel and medicine that it was supposed to go to. It went to his loyalists. And again, the, the, the UAE is offering to lend money, and we'll talk about the UAE later. Uh, but uh, the, the, this will put Sud South Sudan into poverty for generations. And, and sadly, the UAE seems to be supporting the irregulars, the RSF, in, in, the, in the battle. 
So, it, you know, it's a, it's a very, very bleak story from what was once, both parts of what was once Africa's biggest country. What a, <laughs> what a disappointment. Um, is, is there better news in Senegal? Well, I, I think so, but the French don't. Senegal, if we talk about client <laughs> states, was 100%, 100% client state of France. You know, its position on international affairs, for example, in its own continent, in South uh, in uh, Western Sahara, uh, it's just a, a repetition of the uh, French position, you know. And, and, and they're a country that, well, they're about to produce gas and, and oil, but they haven't yet started. Uh, they, they have now a new president, Basiru Diomai Fai, 44 years old, Africa's youngest elected president, people are saying. Can you imagine? How old? 44. 44 years old, a former tax inspector. And he's not from the kind of rich. He didn't go to a private school abroad. He was schooled there. He didn't want to become uh, the president. But Usman Sonko, the guy who would have shooed in, uh, was jailed, uh, as was uh, as Faye at, at one point. But, mm -hmm. And they were both released a week before the elections. But Sanko has a conviction that didn't allow him to stand. So he endorsed Faye. And Faye ended up winning first round in, in, in this election, 54% of the vote. There were 19 mm. candidates. Uh, and then another, the, the Amadou Ba, who was from the ruling party, he came in with only 30% uh, of the votes. But of the 19, not one, uh, 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 part of the, the other 17, in other words, got more than 3% of the vote. And the first woman uh, candidate got less than 1%. So the, 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 what what um, Faye is promising is to relook at uh, relations with uh, traditional allies, and France is one of those. And I'll tell you some of the things he's been saying about them. But there will be a new currency, he says, to replace the Central African franc, which is you know French controlled, um, and uh, also to to look at contracts. Uh, certainly, with oil and gas coming, that's very important. But, you know, you have fishermen, for example, saying hopefully he can do something for us because foreign trawlers and illegal fishermen are ruining our fishing stocks. And from their place where they protect their boats and fix their nets and beach their boats, etc., you can look up and see the villas of the very rich. And that shows the divisions in that country, the inequality, which is what we suffer too. But, uh, you know, are, are we the most in unequal uh, country in on, in Africa maybe, but Senegal, you know, would 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 give us a go on on that amount. But here, Faye speaking, saying that France, it is time for France to lift its knee off our neck to put an end to just oppression, unjust oppression. We have centuries of misery, human trafficking, colonization, neo-colonization, and they have caused unbearable suffering. This We must end the circle of oppression. It's high time for France to leave us alone. They must learn from other African countries. Germany is the leading power in Europe, uh, overtaken by France. Um, uh, but, and three or four, uh, it doesn't exploit any other country. Italy, Spain, they don't bother with any African. African country, excuse me. Well, any African country that uh, uh, doesn't bother their former colonies. But uh, what grounds does France believe it can continue to imp uh, to impose leaders on us, make changes to our, on our behalf? This must come to an end. The, the emerging Africa elite diaspora, the youth, are all saying no to French hypocrisy, and he, he gives it uh, details on that, but we expect nothing from France, he says. We, they desire, but they desire, we desire her to stop meddling in our affairs and uh, collaborate is this with just, Is this not what every president says when they come to power because it's well, easier to just go at the colonial masters than to address the real problems? But that it should happen in Senegal is very, very important. He calls for France to completely withdraw from Africa. And I, I find that hugely interesting. Now, I was saying earlier that, you know, Africa, certainly West Africa, breathed a sigh of relief when uh, uh, Macky Sall's plan to delay elections in Senegal, which is the bastion of democracy there, uh, failed. 
Uh, he tried to hang on for about a, another year. Uh, and I breathed a sigh of relief. And I thought France would have breathed the deepest sigh of relief because uh, that is the coup-ridden part of our continent. Uh, and then now suddenly things are working there. Democracy has worked. The legal system to cause the election, force the election has worked. But I think the French are looking. I'm waiting to see where, how France responds to yeah. Faye's very, very tough remarks. Um, kudos to him. I wish him all the luck in the world, actually. Well, uh, I, I, I'm going to keep an eye on that. Yeah. I think everybody is, you know, to be frank, uh, he, he he's an impressive young man. As I say, 44 years old, former tax inspector. He promises to rule with humility and with mm. transparency. That is something also, that every, nice every to see, president Also, nice says. to see an African president who isn't over 70 years old. Like, thank God yeah. for that. Um, all right. Well, what about the what about the UAE? Because we often talk about China and Russia and how involved they are in Africa. You know, the neo-colonialists. The uh, we talk about the French now with Senegal, but we've got Chinese and Russian colonialism happening in full force as well. And nobody seems to be complaining about them quite as much as they did about the uh, forces of the 1800s. However. The UAE, it's, it seems, has become the fourth largest in, uh, investor in Africa with $4.5 billion committed to the continent's clean energy. Um, there are obviously different kinds of investment here. I mean, Russia sending the Wagner Group is not the same kind of investment as the UAE putting actual money into things. Uh, Africa and clean energy, is this a priority for us or are we just taking money from wherever we can take it as usual? As usual, the fact I like the you know, colonial story. You know, when I went last to China, uh, I was speaking to uh, well, he's now a vice foreign minister. They have more than mm. one deputy well, vice foreign minister who was formerly ambassador here, and he laughed and said, "You know, we are called neo-colonialists, uh, but the, by, in fact, the, and the only people really complaining about it are the former colonial powers. You know, and they really know about colonialism." much more than we ever do but so we don't take these these charges uh, very seriously but now that the uae has stepped in with this further amount there's uh, 60 billion dollars uh, uh, has been uh, invested uh, between 2012 and 2022 it's good to do that not to count the money that was invested during colonial time uh, by the emirates now they're the number four investor in africa uh, over this past decade that is behind China, Europe, and the United States. There are turmoil over investment deals. Uh, there are social environmental repercussions to the inv uh, investments they have made. Uh, but uh, the UAE is the number one investor from the Gulf, and, they, and it is followed by Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Kuwait. But very mm -hmm. interestingly, the countries are coming back, in other words, investing in those countries and 21,000 African countries have been established in the United Arab Emirates. So that is certainly a new theater of investment for us. And, but unfortunately, as I say, they've been involved. The, 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 the Saudi Arabia trying to mediate uh, between the uh, rapid support forces and the army in Sudan. But the UAE, again, seems to be supporting Hameti, the RSF leader. So they must, you know, to, to investment is fantastic, but involvement in the struggles in Africa, in the in the internecine fighting, is is not a good thing at all. Well, I suppose you can't uh, choose the means of someone's assistance. Mm -hmm. You either accept their assistance, and then the conditions they're on, uh, they're, they're, they're to attached thereto, or you uh, don't accept their assistance, right? JJ, it's Absolutely. always good to talk to you. Thank you for that information. Um, useful stuff to know and certainly a lot more interesting than what we would glean from the non-existent African focus of the rest of the South African press. So mm. thank you for your, uh, your insights as always. Great to see you. JJ Cornish and African Analysis brought to you by the Johannesburg Business School this morning. Good, good to be with you. I'm still and again. I'm back.
There you go. Good stuff. Mm. All right. We will be back in just a moment, everybody. We've got a quick break and then it's Democracy 101. So there he is. Uh, we're talking to a guy called Mpo Dagad, mm. who's written this book, I Am the Vision. Just yep. a you know, small, humble brag. Yeah. <laughs> the entire thing. Uh, so so not <laughs> claiming too much. But we'll find out what he has to say for himself. Democracy 101. Of course, it's getting closer and closer to those elections. Yes, it is. We will be back with that and a whole lot more. Stick around. All right, it is Tuesday morning and the 2nd of April, brand new month and a new week of uh, discussions around democracy 101. This is where we come to grips with uh, who the, the the major influences are on our democracy, what we need to know, yep. what we need to pay attention to. We've spent a lot of time focused on the elections themselves, but we're also looking at the people involved in politics, the people who have a message to share, the people who are making a contribution yeah. to our democracy. In some and shape think, or form, yeah. I think our guest here this morning is uh, definitely an example of that. His name is Mpo Dagad, and he's written uh, an interesting book called I Am the Vision, something which uh, Jack has spent some time reading. Did you do your homework? Yes, I did. Very yes, good. I did. Very good. Well, he's with us this morning. How's it, Mpo? How are you? I'm well, thank you. It's nice to see you. Yeah, let me no, turn on your mic good. there. There we go. There we are. Very good. Perfect. Good morning, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Very good. So the first thing I want to clear up is you are not Rise Mzanzi. You are Arise South Africa. Yes. Different I... story, a similar name. Uh, are, does that upset you? Is this like um, Quanto is sees where in the ANC uh, <laughs> MK party? Does the MK belong to the ANC or not? Arise <laughs> South Africa. Rise Mzanzi. 
Yeah, look, we registered first with with the IEC and and when they registered after us, we tried to object it, um, emphasizing the fact that this would confuse voters. The IEC felt that they start with an R, we start with an A. They felt that we're in two different places in the ballot paper. So they allowed it to happen. But if we did have our way, we would have wanted them not to use Oh, you must take up uh, that issue with Sonia yeah. Zazibi and company. Huh? <laughs> but I, I, I think it goes to show just how much uh, trouble we are in as a country. If multiple politicians are thinking of coming up with a name that has to do with rising, we are yeah. clearly at the We're bottom clearly, of the we've food chain. Fallen we have if fallen. If we need to rise. Oh, that's yeah. true. That's do you think so? True. Is that is that fair? Look, I think majority of our people still live in poverty. Um, and I think it's been 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a recent study that was done that I found quite interesting. It basically said that South Africa, well, it was looking at who are the richest countries in the world. And they did a whole lot of different countries, looked at mineral resources, the youth in the country, the potential of the country. It was a whole array of different things. Right. And they couldn't come up with who's number one. It was very difficult for them to do so. But they said, we've got the top three that we're all arguing about. And they said, this is the top three. And they said, one, Russia. Well, not one. One of them is Russia. Congo and South Africa. Mm. So we live in a country that is the richest country in the world or part of the top three, if you want to put it that way. Is this just in terms of what mineral resources? So this is in terms, it was, it was a more vast study. They looked at mineral resources. They looked at the water. They looked at the climate. They looked at sustainability. They looked at the farmland. They looked at a whole lot of different things. The mm. one thing they didn't look at, which is brilliant, was the politicians. Oh my God. Which yeah. I think that's, otherwise that's, we would have come up the Otherwise bottom. we would have. <laughs> I don't we think we would have made the cut. <laughs> so, nope. so they looked at what we have, yeah. Before we get into any of that, I do want to remind people of, of we did, I've in, interviewed you once before. We spoke long ago. You are not only the acclaimed author of this uh, book, Mr. Bitcoin, How I Became a Millionaire at 21, which you did. Um, but you also are a keynote speaker, debater, engaging talk show host, and now you're going into politics. We're yes. going to talk about that. But as an entrepreneur and a businessman with many years of experience, why the hell would you go into politics? I asked this of Herman Mashaba years ago when he first announced that he was going to go into mm -hmm. politics. And he said, like, he, you can't operate on an island. You, you can't exist in a vacuum. You have to rise up with the society around you. In other words, you can't think that you can trample on all the other people's misery and still make it. Is that kind of what you also were motivated by or is there something else going on? Look, I think for me, the journey was different. So I became quite successful in my field, blockchain technology. And in 2018, Sir Ramaphosa asked me to join his advisory committee on the fourth industrial revolution. So I became a commissioner of the fourth industrial revolution in the office of the president. So mm. I got to sit with them, understand what's going on, understand the problems at depth. And I think when you get into such a position, I, I'm a young person, so I'm still very, my outlook on life is still very naive to say we want to do change. So by the way, when right? the president mm. asks you to be an advisor like this, do they pay you? So we were paid, um, but yeah, it's not what people think it is, but yes, we were paid. It's yeah. funny yeah. That, that you had to add that caveat, but it's fine. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead. Look, I, think <laughs> if, if I can mention the amount we were paid if people if want no, to know. No, no, no. Sorry. Okay, cool. Sorry. So, so in that process of you sitting down and advising a president on what to do, you get invested, right? Because you're sitting down with mm. documents that the general public doesn't see mm. of all the issues in the country, what people are going through, what they're experiencing, and you get invested in, I want to solve this problem. And I think the entrepreneur in, in me is a problem solver to say, how do we yeah. solve the problem? How do we fix this? You know? mm. And I worked so hard in ensuring that we come up with solutions that would fix the country only to hand those solutions over to ministers and politicians. And they're like, oh, well, this is nice, but thank you. Yeah, we, but thanks, but no thanks, you know. Sort of um, vibe, yeah. And Paul, this fourth industrial revolution, I see someone, uh, slippery pickle in the comments, fourth industrial revolu revolution throwing up. Um, is, is that, have we not gone beyond that already? Because I mean, it's become some, like somewhat start, of a buzzword. Yeah, they started talking about this. I will never forget that terrible minister of communications, Faith, uh, what was her name? She was she was in charge of the SABC among other things. Yes, at the time. she she was uh, the minister of telecommunications yeah, or something she, like and that. And she was talking about like we've got to digitize this, and I mean they're still not digitized at the SABC. But True. Mm. She would throw around fourth industrial revolution like she'd come upon some very important and and and, and it's like a moment of enlightenment. Yeah, like I this is where it's going, and look, this proves that I'm not an idiot. Yeah, and I think. You know, when, when politicians come up with a buzzword like this, and fourth industrial revolution was a buzzword, 
And you're a guy who's built blockchain technology. You actually understand this stuff. Were you able to make any headway at all? Because these guys, they pay, they pay lip service to it. They, they catch a, a catch phrase mm-hmm. and then they beat it to death. But they don't ever really ask, did anyone, was he, anyone even curious, like, what is blockchain technology? Did you get any government? And I'm not trying to just, you know, knock the government because I do believe that there are probably some good people who are trying very hard to make things better. I just, we don't know who they are at director general level or whatever. Any of them ever ask you questions, genuine curious questions about like, how does this work? What is Bitcoin? How does uh, the, the, the blockchain technology that you're, an expert in afford us an opportunity to create jobs, do things differently. Did they ask you questions? So they didn't. And I think what <laughs> what what I sort of learned through through my experience of being there is that things are not the way that they seem. So so when I got into the advisory, I said to the guys, and a lot of us agreed to say the first thing we must do in our country is zero rate internet, right? Because if you look at any mm nation like South Africa. We have a vast population of people and people are very ill-informed. We've got yeah. uneducated, we've got people that are getting the wrong education, and we've also got people that are getting education, but in a limited sort of way. Mm. So we wanted to zero rate the internet, but the big problem became when on that advisory committee, the CEO of Vodacom and the CEO of MTN were also present. And we were all saying, well, look, let's re- zero rate internet so that you know we can begin to talk about the fourth industrial revolution. And these CEOs are saying, what about our profits? These CEOs are saying, what about what we're doing? You know, and you sort of find out that you know, politicians have shares and this one has shares. And really, the country is not able to move forward because these corporates put their shares before the citizens. Mm. And you see it because we can't discuss any form of technology without internet. We, it's, a, it's a non-starter. Right. So, so what I found was that a lot of times politicians use the right words that could be solutions, mm. but those solutions don't get off the ground because... I think in, in, in their world, they want to say the speech and not implement. Now, given, given what you just said, um, you're a politician now. Why should anyone believe what you have to say? Because, I mean, it, it could be lip service, just like every other politician that we've heard before. Uh, you're certainly not the first politician to put out a book. Uh, you know what I mean? There's There's... There's a lot of things that we have heard in the past 30 years that have made a lot of South African voters, you know, not take politicians seriously. Why should we take you seriously? I think that's a question that I've, I've, I've also looked into. And I think that's why I titled the book, I Am The Vision. Okay. Right? Because in that statement, I'm trying to say to people that we need to stop waiting for politicians to save us. Each and every one of us in South Africa are the vision of what the country should be. And I think the first thing that I would do in getting into government is making sure that we take power away from politicians. Mm. In South Africa, politicians have too much power. If you look at this country, over 50% of the money that's in circulation comes from government. Mm. So if you're getting somebody who's spending 50%, and by the way, this is your money because you're the taxpayer, right? If somebody's spending 50% of your money, Mm -hmm. of that, you're paying 15%. If you're out in the upper enchilantes of being paid, you're paying 30 something percent. You also pay your rates and taxes, your water levies, et cetera, et cetera. Look, majority of your money is going to these people. And as a result of that, you should be expecting more from these people and we should hold them more accountable. Mm -hmm. So one of my things is to say that we need to destabilize the power that government has. We need to put back the power into institution because we live in a country where these ministers have too much power. And, and, And it's a conversation that a lot of people would never really say because they go into government to say, well, we want to use this power to do this and the other. But the truth is the entrepreneurs are the people that really cause changes in our nation. Mm. So a lot of what I stand for, what Arise South Africa stands for is to say, let's actually empower the institutions that be and destabilize the politicians. Let's so, defund them. So what would you do if you got enough votes to have a seat? And what would you do if you get enough votes to be president? Let's imagine a hypothetical scenario. It's highly unlikely, but let's just put that aside for a second. Let's imagine the people of South Africa went, oh, hell yeah, I will go with this guy. And we'll do it because these are his policies. So what are those policies? So I think the, what fir- would you do? the first thing is to ensure that we empower entrepreneurs. There's a big myth around here that jobs are created by politicians. And jobs really aren't. Jobs are made by entrepreneurs. So mm. the first thing we do is empower the small business. 
find entrepreneurs that have employed three, four people, go in there and say, and we're not finding entrepreneurs that are just sitting down saying, I've got a business plan. Mm. We're finding people that have already got three and four people employed and say, look, how do we make sure you employ 10 people? And they let us know to say, right, for me to employ 10 people, I need this, that, and the other. Now people would say, but there's already a department of small business doing that. I've looked into the department of small businesses. Mm. Majority of the businesses they fund fail. The reason that happens is because their funding mechanisms are not based on people that have started something, but they're just based on people that are applying based on an idea. And any entrepreneur knows that the first business, you will fall flat, mm. even the second one and the third one. So it's about plugging into ecosystems that are already working and growing those ecosystems to create jobs. So that's the first thing. How do we find somebody who's employing three, four people and say, listen, we want you to employ 20 people. What do we do? How do we do that successfully? The second thing, is going after the land. Now, this is a controversial matter that a lot of people say, mm. but I, I, I find that that's one of the things we have to do. What do I mean by going after the land? If you own land in this country, you're privileged, right? And if you've got a privilege, privilege must come with responsibility. What if we had to say, and I'm, I'm talking hypothetical here, that if you own 100 hectares of land, for every 100 hectares of land that you own, you must produce one job, Right? And let's say the landowners say, well, we own the land. Why are we going to listen to you, et cetera, et cetera. Then we say, look, if your land is not producing jobs in our nation, then we're going to need to take it back and give it to people who will use it to produce land. I'm sorry, to produce jobs and grow the economy, right? Mm. And come up with a concept that Australia has implemented beautifully to say that let the land produce jobs for the people that live in it. And those that have land and they are not doing anything with that land. Let's take that land and give it to other people that but will actually not, do okay, something. So, so then you don't that, believe in property rights. That, that is difficult. Oh, yeah, it's no, because I mean, yeah. like that. let's get straight to it. Because if you, if you don't believe in property rights, like you, you as the government have the right to take land away if you think someone isn't using it properly. Look, I think, I think my, my issue with the property rights you're referring to would have to go back to history to say, how do we define who owns what land? Well, I own hmm. this phone. If you don't think I'm using it properly and you believe in your policies, you could take it away hold from on. You, you don't believe in property. You bought the phone. No? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. What if you bought the land? No, Most people in this country have a, have a proof of their land ownership. They've got a title. Okay. They might have a title, but we need to look at how did they acquire the land, right? So this land now... Most people who are alive now bought it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're then talking about majority, uh, sorry, a minority of the land, right? And that's not the land we're talking about. No, the majority of the land in this country is owned by the government. Yes, so, it is. So who are we disposing? You see, nothing is for nothing. You understand this as a business. Of course. Yeah, you know, nothing comes out of a vacuum. Yep. So there is already an existing structure. Now we may want to disrupt that structure, but if your solution is property rights don't exist, then there is no economy. Okay. And because so, 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 I, can, so, I can take your Bitcoin. Yeah, because, okay. and, and the headache I have when it comes to the land question, specifically when it comes to history, is how far do we go back? Cool. I, I love that you guys are saying this because I think we, we can't look at it from a vacuum, right? Mm. Australia and New Zealand say to the whole world, you come to Australia and New Zealand, we'll give you land that people are not using to be able to farm, right? Sure. And they say, as long as you're producing jobs for our people, we'll give you the land, right? Where do they get this land from? One, they take it from people that are not using it as a country, right? Two, take it. Hmm. Well, if you're saying... Uh, as I far mean, as I know, they do have property rights there. I mean... Look, look, I, I, th I think the semantics of property rights, because I think you're, you're basing it on... It's not semantics. This is hugely important because people is. won't work if, you, if, you, if they're not going to own what the fruits of their labor. No, but, but I think... Why would they, and why would you hire people? You talk about job creation. Yes. Why would you hire people if you don't have something for them to do? The purpose of job creation is not to create jobs. It is for those people who have jobs and those people for whom jobs might be created, to have things that they can do, that they perform a valuable service in the economy. Cool. Mm -hmm. Just giving people a salary is not doing anything for the economy. Look, so, so in countries where they did implement this, right, what they began to see is that they began to see farmers move from Zimbabwe or automatically go to Australia, South Africa go to Australia, because they said, when we get to Australia, the government gives us land. Right now, you might ask the questions right now to say this sounds impractical, sounds like it won't work, sounds like it's property rights. But what you will quickly find is that there's a lot of people that own land in this country that one, they are not using the land, two, they don't plan who, on using the who land. Who are these people who are not using I the mean, land? I mean, if you look at the, the, the land statistics, it shows you that we've got so much arable land that's not being used, millions of hectares that's not being used.
people that have owned this land ever since their grand grand grandfather owned the land. Yeah. Sure, I, mean, I, I don't think that's look, look, true. I mean, it's true. If look, you, if you own land and you're not using it, I, I, I wonder who those people are that are so wealthy well, but, that they don't. But Gareth, you, you can't tell me that you've, you've I walked, mean, you've, I mean, you've traveled South Africa. You can't tell me that the land that you see I that see, is arable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I see on. vast farms. I yeah, see, there's, I see there's, forests. There's, there's, I see people who are engaged in the economy already. It's not like they're not using the land. There's multiple ways that that. You know, land is used across the country. My question is, it, it speaks specifically to the property rights that Gareth's talking about. Saying that you're just going to take the land and give it to people that are going to use it sounds uh, a bit more abrasive than saying we will incentivize people who are not using their land. Well, it's straight up, perhaps... it's straight up state confiscation. Yeah, because right? that's <laughs> what that's what it's like. You know? Land expropriation without compensation. That, on the face of it, is a bad idea. Look, I, I think. The, the issue that I'm having with at you this guys point, is, you're the last person I'm going to vote for. Even do this <laughs> is more reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I mean, I love, I love the the, the 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 robust debates, and I'd love to hear what other people's perspectives are. But maybe let me bring it to this point, right? What is your definition of who owns the land? Because well, there are people in this country that are saying we don't need definite. I have a title deed for the property I live yeah, in. But how did you get your title? Deed? I paid for the property. Who did you pay? I paid the bank. Gave me the no, money. There, there, there are people who got the, the, the bank that owned me. the land for many years that never got it from the bank. That who? came a lot of people. There's a lot of trust in this country that own farms that bake back way I, back I, before. If apartheid. they have, if they have documentary evidence to prove that they have a claim to the land, then that gives them a better claim than someone who's making it up or someone who says that they don't own anything. True, whatsoever. and that's the land we're dealing with. We're not dealing with land that you bought or you're living in to say, oh, we're just going to come and grab your land. We're dealing but with how, unused land. How can I trust land? you with that? Because hmm. it's taken you this long to get to the explanation. How could I trust you with anything? What if you're going to come and take my TV because you think I'm not using my TV properly? Right. That's not a sensible economic policy. <laughs> Look, I this think it's like what was, did you make this up with your friends at a drunken Brian? one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I think you need to look at how Australia and New Zealand is doing it and look at how it's affected Australia the and New Zealand are completely different kettle of fish to us. They don't look, have our history. They don't have our, 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 our struggles and difficulties. They also have competent governments Mm. which I don't necessarily agree with. There's nothing about the Australian government I'm jealous of. Yeah, they, I mean, they, they, of late but, they've been weird. But they do have competence. And also, I think we have a different sort of constitution here. Okay. Maybe, maybe let me put it to, to, to you, because I think a lot of times when we comment on land, we speak from a place of privilege, right? The three of us here, we're in Santon, right? We're mm. sitting in privilege, right? Let's no, I, I'm still paying for my house. Cool. I don't know what you mean. I know what you mean, but you're not in the shack. No one gave me, you know, but no one gave me anything. But the majority of the people so in this country. No one gave you anything. Shack. You became a millionaire because you were working you hard worked at it. and you invested carefully and you built technology. So, so I don't understand why you feel like you have to take on guilt for the people who didn't. No, but I think this Otherwise, is the, just give away your money. Stop talking shit and just give away your money. But this is the disconnect that people have. That a lot of people think that way to say, oh, everybody who's living in a shack is lazy. No, they're no, not. No, 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 nobody no, no, said no, that. No, but, yeah. but if you feel guilty about being Rich. It's not about the guilt. It's not well, about the don't, guilt. Don't assume. I, I'm not going to say I'm privileged. Okay, maybe let's not get into the privileged conversation. But you got you started it. Okay, cool. But believe me, you <laughs> where we're sitting right now, we, we're part of the privileged in South Africa because majority of the people live in poverty. Now, I want to put it to you to say, how do you employ majority of these people that live in poverty that have tried to what get jobs? What are you jobs? employing them for? Okay. We're employing them to use the land to create produce. This is farmable land that can be used. What if they don't farm. want to farm land? They don't want to be laborers. You think they want to chill in the, in the shack all day? I don't think they want to chill in the shack all day, but a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs like you. Yeah, that's fine. They, they, but what I'm saying is entrepreneurship begins from somewhere. It might start so by... You're going to make them go and work the farms like slaves first. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's what it sounds like. I mean, it's just a salary, but no, otherwise no, no, no. it's like... It's, it's not... You guys who are sitting in the shack, <laughs> get on your... Yeah, I'm giving you a hard time, but you deserve it. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it because I yeah. think get up the off your get up off, You're the one who's saying get up off your backside. You're not allowed to stay in the shack all day, and we're going to put you to forced labor on the farms. No, so 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 I'm not the one who's saying that. They are saying the farms, by the way, that we've taken away from people from who people. already own them. It might have been working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, 
they are saying, the people are saying to us, look, in South Africa, it's difficult for us to do anything because firstly, the shack we live in, we don't even own the land on it. Already we're starting on the back foot. Right? Okay. So That's a lot true. of them are saying, we're not ever going to have the dignity. When somebody says, we've stolen something or we've done this, or we've done that, they said, we don't feel that we, we are part of South Africa. And that's the reason why so when we vote... why don't you start with getting people title deeds to the property they already have? Of course, yes, definitely. That's yeah. something that we're definitely going to do. I agree to say, let's... But to your point, the title deed we're giving them is somebody's land that you're saying, right? Because they didn't have any land. Right. They set up, they, they, they shacks there and they're living there. And by us giving them the title deed, oh, we're taking the land away from somebody. But I, I, I want to bring this point to all of you, right? To say... Mm. If you've got over 1.6 million households in South Africa that are living in shacks, right? And you believe that they are living in shacks because they have not tried their best no, to no, get out of there. Nobody cares. No, but that. I'm not saying you guys. I'm yeah, talking okay. about the general public, right? right? And you believe that they are living in shacks because they've not tried their best. They have not applied themselves. They're not. I think that you're speaking from a point of not understanding it. I've sure. been to these places and I've sat down with them to say, what are you going to vote for? What do you want? And they said, when we hear somebody say they'll give us an RDP, we want to vote because for the first time in our lives, we'll have ownership of something that means dignity to us, right? Mm. Now, it might upset the few people that say, well, whose money are you going to use, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the minority, the privileged minority. Well, let's not use privilege so that we don't get into that word. But the, the well, fortunate. Well, the haves the, the have not. Yeah, the, right. The well, haves, let's right? just remember sure. also that the haves are paying the taxes, the majority of the taxes yeah. in this country that are paying to keep the wheels Seriously. turning. And, and so come to think of it, uh, I remember Roman mentioned this, that... Uh, 20% of what SARS collects is from income tax and the rest is just compliance. So there's ineptitude in SARS. There's, there's, oh, there's holes everywhere. But, now, I think what I want to get into, right? Uh, you're saying that, you know, someone who looks at people who are living in shacks and uh, in, in, in abject poverty are just sitting there because uh, some people might think that they're just lazy and all of this stuff, right? We know that to not be the truth. Okay. Now, my question goes to entry level jobs. Okay. Your your ideas about you know making farms and all of this stuff, or yeah, even sure. the fourth industrial revolution and, and, and like, blockchain. And you're not going to be able to pull some guy out of the shack and immediately no, teach him how to be. You're a definitely not going engineer. to do that. So Look. I think if 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 anything, the jobs that should be uh, pushed are those where you've got people working in buildings such as these. You give them skills that are transferable from one place to another. We need we need electricians. We need plumbers. Yes. We need people that can lay pipes. We Definitely. need all of those things. Now, telling us about farms and whatnot, I'm not sold on it. Let's talk about some of these, I don't want to say basic, but entry-level jobs. Okay, cool. So, so, so maybe let me bring it back to the way I started the, the conversation is to say that we are the richest country in the world, or top three, if sure. you want to put it that way, right? The narrative that Africans must always work entry-level jobs must change, first and foremost, right? Okay, That's not the goal, right? Paul, I'm going to have to stop you there because it's, this sounds like um, platitudes. Okay, so this narrative changing thing. Let's just be realistic for a second. Okay. The reason that so many people are sitting at home in shacks is not because they're lazy. Mm -hmm. It is because there is not enough going on in the economy for them to be meaningfully or gainfully employed, employed yeah. or because they don't have any skills that the economy can use. Okay, so so I, do you I, agree with that? No, no. Okay, can I speak? Right, oh. I, I I just also want to speak here. Right, sure. You've got mines in this country that for years have exported the minerals on a daily basis. Right, we have more trucks leaving with minerals in our country than any other country known in this earth. Right, platinum, vanadium, gold, silver, oh. diamonds. Right, mm. those produce or those minerals could be processed in our country, right? They are not. The reason why they're not processed in our country, number one, is because of issues like politician competence, whether the, the, the labor force will be able to participate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Number two, in Limpopo, you've got avocados, mangoes, lychees, uh, all leaving over, right? They're going to Dubai, they create serums, they come back, people buy them as lotions, et cetera, et cetera. You've got wood leaving from Sanin, it goes to China, it becomes toothpicks, it comes back, it's sold to our people, right? But you don't think anything here has to do with skills? Like, do we have the skills to do those things so, at the cost that they do in Indonesia? Cool. So with the tech that's available now, skills is no longer the conversation it used to be, right? I'll give you an example, 3D printing. 
You're able to put raw materials in 3D printing and immediately you have finished codes. So the skills conversation would have been relevant 10 years ago. But who... in, in today's day and age, where there is technology available for us to do these things, it's about the will of the government in order to implement that. Yeah, but you're not going to just put any random person in front of a 3D printer. Like it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a walk in the park. Yeah. No, 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 but I mean, I never said it would be random. But what I'm saying is that don't subject us to okay. artisans but and be, plumbers be, and be this real. We will do that. Be realistic. But also, we must go for the 3D printing. Our education system is a dis disaster, right? So we're not producing skilled people. Yes. Uh, you acknowledge that. Definitely. Yeah. Right. So how are you going to get someone to operate the 3D printer, which they can't afford because they're already unemployed? Mm. Okay. They now need to learn the skills to operate the 3D printer. Technology can only go so far if you don't have the skills to make sense of the technology, just as you learned from Bitcoin. I mean, I remember our conversation about blockchain. Yes. And you yeah. know what you're talking about there, but most people in this country have no grasp on the idea of blockchain. Most people in this country are so poorly educated because of this government that they are not useful in the economy. I said it before, it's not that they're unemployed, it's that they're unemployable. So mm. how do we fix that? Right, so, so allow me to go through a case. And by the way, I know it's unfair to load all these problems onto yeah. you, but we're talking no, about the economy. Of course, yeah. yeah. We, we may stumble upon a solution. He's running for president, it's right. fair. Yeah, yeah and, fair. and I mean, it's I, fair. I love it because the more frank we are with politicians, the better. Yes. You know, I hope you, you do this with all politicians. Yes, we Can't do. be asking me what my favorite breakfast is. No. <laughs> now, when we look at India and we realize what India's done, right? Yeah. What happened in India is they went to remote villages and they said, give these people the internet, right? Oh. They dropped off devices and they dropped off the internet in India, in remote villages, right? When they came back after five years, they found that 96% of the youth in that village understood how to program, right? Mm -hmm. They went in and they asked these kids, who taught you how to program? They were all like, we went on YouTube. We heard that Mark Zuckerberg became a billionaire through creating Facebook. He learned how to program. We're now programmers, right? They also found that 15% of the kids there were now able to program a program like Uber, right? Which many people would say, oh, Uber's quite difficult. Uber's, you need to learn, you need to learn for Uber. And they came back and said, young kids in India, who taught you how to program an Uber program? They were like, listen, we looked at the price of Uber. We saw everybody becoming rich and all of us programmed Uber, right? Mm. Now you come back and you ask yourself, who taught these people? Where was the university? Where's the lecturer? Who taught them how to program? All they did is they gave them internet and gave them devices. And here the in South Africa, we've had, we've had the internet. We have two phones for every person. It, it, that means uh, almost that conversation every... for me is so tricky because the internet is so expensive in this country. Okay, fair enough. But, sure. but people, yeah. people prioritize it to the point where even if you haven't got money for food, you have money for airtime or for data. We know that. We know people prioritize it. Hmm? Look at, at so at, why are they, what are they doing with their data? Going on TikTok and learning a dance. India, in India, huge population of people, massive, massive competition to get ahead because poverty there is way, way worse than it is here. Yes. Like mm -hmm. absolute poverty. You haven't seen that until you've been in India. I'm sure you agree. So where are the are, are you just gonna like throw the internet? And listen, I'm all I'm with you, hundred percent with you. We should zero rate the internet. Mm. Of course, that still means someone somewhere has to pay for it, which right. means probably the taxpayer, because that's always the guy that's carrying. <laughs> that's mm. fine. You pay tax, Jack mm -hmm. pays tax, I pay tax. And mm. we understand part of that is making society better. Right. So I would rather see it going to zero rating the internet than going into like parastatals that are gonna waste our money. Mm -hmm. So I'm with you. But are you convinced of the fact that we will produce skilled labor? And even if people teach themselves with YouTube videos and they become entrepreneurs, that doesn't need government. So you're almost talking yourself out of a job if you're president and you talk like that. No, because I mean, the evidence doesn't point to South Africans using the internet to do, to do useful things with it. Yeah. Like we've got the youth unemployment in Gauteng. Let's, okay. let's talk specifically about Gauteng. Um, you, if, if, how thing was some remote rural village somewhere and you didn't have access to Wi-Fi and all of those things. In Gauteng, it's very difficult for someone to say, no, I don't have access to this or that in terms of technology. Yeah. So, so but it doesn't seem like we've been using it to no, we're on, we're the things Twitter that you're TikTok. talking about. Yeah. It's unfortunate because my, my explanations, I would want them to be long so we can get it, but I'll try to compress on. it, no, right? No, okay, You've cool. got We've got the benefit so, of time so here. So let's it. look at something. It hasn't been studied. I've studied it personally, mm -hmm. right? But it hasn't been published out there. 
Let's look at something like Forex, right, in South Africa. What a lot of companies did with Forex is they found influential people. They gave them money. They gave them cars. Go out and post that you made money off trading and go out there and host conferences and get people involved. Margin trading. Let's go. Put in all your money. Let's go, right? And immediately you found an African youth that believed in Forex and that tried Forex. The amount of Forex accounts that have been opened in this country are more than university students per year. And what we saw, we saw a trend or a, 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 a culture where people started to believe that people are making money through Forex, right? And everybody was sort of saying, Forex is the next thing. We're all involved in Forex, right? Mm. Then we saw a second trend, betting. The same thing happened. They brought in influencers, people that have made money through betting. This guy bought a car, he bought a house. They took photos, they did everything. Whether it was real or not, indulge me, right? Mm -hmm. To say maybe it was a scam. I mean, yeah, let's have those conversations. But indulge me on the fact that there was people who created a propaganda, gave people the internet and showed them the path to success, right? I'm saying, let's create a new propaganda. Let's give people the internet and show them that a blockchain technology uh, 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 engineer can earn 250,000 rand a month. Let's get him to post in front of a Lamborghini. Let's get him to buy a house in Danefern. Let's get yeah, him to, but, to have these... Hold, a, on, hold on, hold on, hold mm. on. And on TikTok, the algorithm is showing everybody every day, blockchain, in, uh, blockchain, blockchain. And everybody in South Africa is like, oh, okay, blockchain is the new Forex, right? Everybody's saying, I want to be an engineer. How are you doing it? Dude, have you seen this guy on, on TikTok? Have you seen this guy? Have you seen this guy? And the government engineers a program that's going to allow people to be indoctrinated with an agenda that the country will actually benefit from, right? Now, it might sound far-fetched, but if Forex and betting could do it, why can't we do that with the skill set that we need to do in our country? I just yeah. worry. I well, think it's. I think you, you illustrate a very interesting example with both betting and Forex. And mm -hmm. I've seen lots of people who've who look like they've made money, but they haven't created value. Yes. Okay? So there's, you know there's a huge difference. That's the first problem is that you're actually by showing Lamborghinis and fancy lifestyles and all this stuff, you're actually showing people cons rampant consumerism rather than creating value. So you're going to attract exactly the wrong people. Entrepreneurs are not that interested in just making money, popping bottles and driving sports cars. A real entrepreneur wants to create something. You said problem solve, yeah. which I appreciate about you. You want to find real ways to solve problems. If we're propagandizing and brainwashing in inverted commas people into seeing success as material wealth we're not going to have real success yeah but, we're, not. But, we're going but, but to attract me, like we're going to attract people who want to see the fruits of this stuff without actually doing the work cool. but remember the question i'm answering the question i'm answering is you saying that if you give south africans the internet how do you know that they'll use it properly okay right? so that's the question i'm answering i'm not basing it on i'm basing it on the fact that where every problem exists, you can create a solution, right? Where people can buy into the solution through the creative ways that you've spoken about. Now, I want to bring it closer to home so that you get it, right? Because I think sometimes, a lot of times when we speak about these things, people find that they're very far-fetched and they, they struggle to connect. Mm. Let's bring it closer to home, right? If you graduate with a degree in entrepreneurship, we will give you 50,000 Rand to start a business. We will only fund small businesses of people that have studied entrepreneurship, right? Now we've taken away the glamour of Forex. We've taken away the glamour of, of, of betting, but we've made it so practical that to people it's reachable. Now you ask, where did this happen? In Singapore. In Singapore, they ensure that they give incentives for certain courses for people to study. And the human brain is like that. The human brain wants to achieve success. They want mm. to know that there's a treasure of gold be, uh, at the end of the tunnel. Mm. We can do this with HIV. We can do this with teenage pregnancy. We can do this with steering the minds of South Africans to think in certain ways by coming up with a success propaganda very similar to what Dubai did. Mm. Because if you look at Dubai and the undersitting of Dubai, there's really nothing there. But if you look at the propaganda that Dubai has sold to the world, I mean, why do you have a police car that's a Bugatti? Dubai, explain it. Why the hell is a police car Dubai? <laughs> no, then people are like, oh, I want to be a policeman because I want to drive a Bugatti when I'm a policeman. Mm. Hey, South Africa, why can't, you, why can't you implement the same thing? And somebody would say, oh, but Dubai is wasting money. There's no crime in Dubai. Mm. There's no crime. People that do policemen in Dubai see it as a, a badge of honor. We have Bugattis in our police force. We have G, G wagons. But we don't, you know. have, we don't have Dubai problems. Oh, but we have Dubai money. The Where? oil that they had. Where? Oh, we yeah. do. We, they won't even let us do fracking in the Karoo or 
or, or drill offshore. They won't let us because we've got sustainable environmental policies. Oh, the, you understand this? I think it's stupid because I think we should be. Of course, we mm. should be using the resources we have. And yes. you mentioned minerals. What are we going to do about the fact that in mining, you've always had labor issues coming head to head with like just unbelievable exploitation. Yep. And at the same time, the idea that we haven't, there's no beneficiation because we can't do anything with these minerals because we have to send them elsewhere for processing. Mm. We don't have the steel mills that we used to. Mm -hmm. We don't make iron in, and, and, and create uh, yeah, the steel industry and, in this and manufacture products out of that stuff. Yeah. We have to send it to China because we've degraded our economy to this degree. Uh, and we don't have the skills to get that back. So, so, so okay. So, so, so maybe then, you know, my, my issue with where a lot of people look at mining is they sort of look at it as though it's impossible for us to do these things in South Africa. And I would rather say it's been made impossible, right? Economies of scale. If I'm China and I'm empowering South Africa to use their minerals, I'm losing jobs. And my constituents in China is not going to vote for me. They're going to lose confidence. I'm going to lose the election, right? My communism might just crumble because people are saying, what the hell is going on with our jobs, right? South Africa, we have been played by many governments that for years have convinced us that we are incapable of using what we have. It's important that whoever gets into power says like Niger, what Niger said to the French, that, hey, guys, time's up. Mm. I'm here now. And starts to actually say to those governments, if you're not going to come to the party, we're going to look for other people to work with, right? L very much like how a businessman is being abused would actually go to the market and say, look, I'm going to look for new customers, right? Same thing. We're looking sure. for new customers as a country. Mm. We're saying, China, you just ship everything off. You've never created any jobs. It's been 30 years. We're looking for new customers. Who is available, guys? We'll give you tax incentives. We'll give you this. We'll give you that. Look, part of running a government is incentivizing entrepreneurs to force them by no other means for them to actually open up factories. I've often said to say, look, I've had conversations with people around Elon Musk that have said that if you zero rate taxes in South Africa for Tesla, Tesla would consider coming of course. here. Mm. Right. And, and uh, we can't even get him to, to bring Sky, Skynet, Skynet here, which would have helped yeah. us because, I mean. because why the government say he has to have a BEE partner? Mm. So he's like, I don't need this shit in my life. I'll just rather <laughs> send it to everyone. Meanwhile in country. Mozambique, they're having a party. Yeah. Let me ask you this, bro. So um, there's a couple of things that you've, a couple of countries actually that you've mentioned. You mentioned India, Dubai, and all of this other Singapore, stuff. Singapore, Niger. Singapore, Niger. But there is a cultural aspect to all of these countries, right? Say what you will of India, but the people of India have on some level placed education on a premium which is why when they dropped off those devices in there, these kids, their first instinct was to try to come up with new things. Educate themselves. Educate themselves and all of this stuff, right? When you look at the culture of this country, like our lifestyles as a country is a burden on our healthcare system. True. Look at the car accident. In fact, when you think about like long weekends, like the one we just had, mm. you look at the vehicular uh, fatalities, you look at the way South Africans drink, the way we eat, all of these things. <laughs> how, how do we fix the culture of this country? We're not saying we hate it. We love this country. No, I love, yeah. I love it too. I love it too. But we like, got, we got to we've got a problem. No, I love this. We've I, got I, I a problem. Much, yeah. no. How do we? How do we go about fixing the culture of this country? Cool. So, so I've advised Starlink, the president. By the way, it's not right. Skynet. Skynet yeah, was Starlink. Yeah, Skynet. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, eh? Terminator. <laughs> cool. So, so, so I've had the opportunity to advise the government. And when you advise the government, you get insight into how companies make money in this country, right? Vodacom and MTN, their profits come from pornography in South Africa. That's where their profits, profits come from. South Africans watch a heck of a lot of porn. Yeah, mm. rather than educating themselves about See blockchain what, yeah, technology. Yeah, yeah. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> right. right. Now, as a government, they've known that Vodacom and MTN have been making profits from... from and, and by the way, these are minors, because I mean, we all know through geo you can tell how or, the age of a person, right? Mm -hmm. Who's using the phone. These are minors, these are young people, it's porn everywhere, right? In Dubai, they've banned pornography, right? After banning pornography, and I know people fight me where they say, but you can't reference productivity to pornography because 
uh, uh, Dubai is is is, is um you, you, is, probably uh, could. you could yeah you oh could. okay great I'm yeah, great you guys are you. You can, no 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 oh. you can skip this part we're not yeah, okay. all right okay cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. I think why right. are we not banning pornography why are we not raising the alcohol limit to 21 years old mm. why not asking shabins and pubs to look for IDs before people enter you're mm. not like going to find US. a fight with us on these things no? and we oh, don't we're, okay. we're not the moralizing type no oh, not. okay I, I, i'm certainly i don't see jack and i climbing in like standing up for pornography or no. standing up for like <laughs> underage oh, drinking no, there, no? there have yeah. been people that have said you're taking away people's rights They've, i mean there are people that have fought me on this. no 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 so so i'm saying let's create a new propaganda and and i'm for propaganda because you're right our culture is very wrong and our culture stems from what the apartheid system created of course it's been 30 years but unfortunately the anc <laughs> government has not created a new culture at all let's create a new culture and already we have instruments in our country that are sub- I'm i mean sorry, the I churches the churches in this country are ready to support our ban on pornography today yeah no the that's cool and all also, but also we talked about this in the first half The ch- churches are also ready to support all these uh, crooked politicians, and they are. They let them in oh, on yeah, Easter I mean, Sunday oh. to uh, muddy the waters. So I, 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 I like a lot of what you say, Mpo, and you know, we're not here to, to like argue with you. We want to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah. But I think a lot of this stuff, you have very good ideas, and a lot of this stuff, you have terrible ideas. And we, we just try to figure out how much of the good stuff we would want to vote for and how much yeah. of the bad stuff we would definitely want to stay away from like and and honestly i i am an accountability nut okay 30 years is long enough for you to establish a new culture i agree and the fact is the nc has that's not his fault no i'm not saying it is it's his <laughs> fault i'm just saying like when you were responding to my question i heard you mention uh, apartheid and what but like i look i am not sitting here trying to say that the apartheid does not have a lingering consequence i'm just saying as a country we have failed as as a result of our leadership we have failed to generate a new kind of culture that one. would lead us into the fourth industrial re- revolution that everyone keeps talking about i agree I agree you, you, you started him like he's going to rant now. So, yeah, so, oh, so <laughs> Paul, I, I see in your, so this comes from your book, but you said, for example, you're going to eradicate gender-based violence and discrimination. Now, I think that's a laudable and excellent goal, but it's a lot harder to do than it is to say. Uh, do you have any like practical ideas of how we could get gender-based violence and discrimination under control? Cool, I do. So so the first thing that we would do is we would report all gender based violence on a blockchain right because what we realize in this country is that when somebody commits a gender based violent crime mm. a lot of times the victim goes back and withdraws the case because they made up or the person sweet talked them or what you know a whole array of reasons right mm. so the perpetrators continually get away with it because they sort of train their their um, victims to say oh after i've abused you i'll come back and i'll buy your watch and da, 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 and it will all go away right mm. if we're recording it on a blockchain it cannot go away it will always be there right even when they withdraw it will say right this person had a case like this and they withdraw right that's the first instance the second instance is opening that up to people to check based on you giving them permission to check right so you're dating somebody the person is new and you say hey can we please check your your gender based violence history on the blockchain and this guy is like no why do you want to do that and you're like oh sorry i don't date anybody who i don't have reference to right But, mm-hmm. and, oh, and, what, what this is before a court case has been filed yeah this is before a court case so this is filed. just an allegation look it will say there that is allegations but That, that's horrific because if that's on someone's record look we're in crisis no 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 so you're saying innocent people will also fall victim to this no this is not going to be a public thing where willy nilly i'm but saying who's going to be able to look it up employers no the person that you gave permission to look remember blockchain you have to have that permission so your relationship partner your lover mm. somebody who says look i want to to be uh, to get but into a relationship then no one will ever give permission But you don't think people will not you, date people who so, so, I can't check up on? No. I mean, you in this th- day and age, think, people check okay, their record well, before they date sure, someone. Sure, sure. Hold on, Mpo. But yeah. in, we're, firstly, let's be clear about what we're talking about. We're talking about gender-based violence. Yes. Mm. This is someone who, for argument's sake, who has been beaten, physically beaten. Yes. Yeah. And then goes back to that person. Do you think that it will stop at, let me see your, uh, your gender-based violence history on the blockchain, that... 
is going to be a hindrance to so, people. So, so what we've noticed is perpetrators continue to be perpetrators with different people, right? Sure. We're saying, we're saying, how do you protect uh, women? And of course, I must say men as well, because it happens on both sides. Yes, it does. From the future of this happening, right? The public records that we have of police cases. Do you know, for example, <laughs> if you fell in love with somebody and you want to find out, does this person have a history of, of GBV? It's impossible. Even if you go to the police station, it's, you have to go to that police station and find that police officer that did it. And there's a file room and the file room is a mess. Basically, anybody who gets away with gender-based violence or has committed gender-based violence in this country, you, you can't find it. It's almost impossible to find it. But right? are we saying that We're, someone who has a case opened against them? Because we, we so, do live in a country with a presumption of innocence. Of course. So of course. I could lay a case against you and say that you assaulted me, but... Mm. That does not necessarily mean, mean that you're you convicted. Are... Yes. yes. But remember, the blockchain will say that. The blockchain will say that. So, so what we're saying is we want a trace, a history trace that cannot be changed by anybody. Because we have a situation in our country, and it's very bad, where perpetrators continue on gender-based violence without a trace. So basically, and, and you know, I, I always say to people that when you go to other countries, right? Mm. If I take your ID and I want to find out about your crimes, literally everything comes up, right? In South Africa, if you want to find out, even when you're hiring somebody and you want to find out about their crime, I mean, really, it's a joke. Uber drivers that are rapists have raped 29 people but, only for the but, police to wake up one day and say, sure, Ooh, on, okay. on, on conviction. And that's mm. why we have a, a, law, a legal system. That's why we have a justice department, but not on allegation. No, no, no. So we'll record both. Right. And we're not saying, remember, we're not saying this will be but used. Then people, people will use it for, you imagine how many jilted lovers or angry uh, resigni resignations from companies, people who've worked for you will say, ah, I'm going to go and make all these allegations about him poor. I mean, people use these things all the time as tools yep. of, of look, war. Look, I, I must say this. It's not based on, it's based on you opening a police case. What I'm saying is when, so I don't think anybody will, will go and perjure themselves by going to lie. Of course, there are people who do mm -hmm. that and they should be dealt with mm -hmm. by the format of the law. But what I'm saying is we need solutions that will stop perpetrators from doing this. And the solutions we've got at the moment are not working. I mean, in this country, we've got 80-something women that are raped on a daily basis. I know. Right? We know that. Yeah. So telling so, us how bad the problem is, I mean, we're completely aware of it. Cool. That, so that's one of the solutions, right? The other solution is also looking at a rehabilitative program in our prisons. So our prisons are very much a free-for-all, right? Mm -hmm. The rapist, the thief, this, that, and the other, shove them into one place and hope for the best. After five years, let's hope this person has been rehabilitated and they're able to come out to society and become better, right? Mm -hmm. We're spending so much money on putting people into prison. But the programs that exist in the prisons do not work to rehabilitate them. Studies have been done on simple things. Getting a perpetrator to understand what they've done and the detriments of what is done for them to get dessert. Something as simple as... I'm a prisoner and I'm going to get dessert if I understand the issues that I've committed. They'll just right? lie. Yeah, These I mean, are criminals. But they're, they're, studies, they're, have showed, <laughs> studies have showed that, that, that they, they, they... I want some custard. Yeah, all right, I did it and I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a bad boy. I shouldn't have done I, that. I, I, think there, I think you have a fundamental um, a, a, a misunderstanding of like, human nature. Look, I think, I think South Africans have been subjected to... A, a misdiagnosis of the human nature. I think that's true. And a lot of people think South Africans are inherently bad. No, no. And, and I, people in general, not South Africans, everyone in the world, and especially those people who have ended up in jail. Mm. You, it's a fair assumption to make that they are probably not people who have the ability to make good decisions or show the best angels of their nature. Yeah, I, I have a different opinion. Well, then you're welcome to it. Go and sort out the prisons. No one's going to stop you. You could become yeah. Minister of Correctional Services tomorrow. There's a job no one wants. Yep. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, even so what I understand about you is that you blockchain, for example, it doesn't matter how honest or dishonest a person is, but you still can't see into their soul no matter how good your technology. Mm. True. Very true. But, but what are the, 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 the ample things we can do to stop such things from happening? And these are some of the well, solutions. I mean, one of the things that I would like to see happen is that blockchain technology, again, something that you, you are well-versed in, could be used to do things like uh, what Vinnie Lingham's trying to do in, in the US with Civic. He, he's yeah. trying to, to create instant referenda so that you could go on here and we could have active participatory democracy mm. 
on issues. Like let's say South Africans were having a big issue around fuel levies and everyone had a South Africa app on their phone, yes. which could verify your, your identity through the blockchain. Mm -hmm. That's a use of technology which we could put into action immediately. Yep. People go in, they use their fingerprint or face ID or whatever, and it, it verifies your once-off vote. You can go and vote on the fuel levy. And everyone in the country who doesn't want to vote, fine. Mm -hmm. But if we have a quorum, again, let's say 20 million South Africans vote on this thing, we can change the law like that. Yep. That would be the, fantastic. The, 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 the recent copyright law when it comes yeah. to artists and whatnot. Would we imagine we how many it people would It would have been great for people to right. jump on immediately from the position that they're sitting. I agree. I, I, I definitely agree. So that, I mean, like that's where you can teach all these uh, other politicians a thing or two. I mean, sure. Land, you're going to be, Julius and his crew will eat you for breakfast. Look, I, I think, so. so <laughs> I have an opinion on that and I think it's been quite interesting to, to see that a lot of times, right, we, we don't understand how the land issue has created many of the problems we sit with today in this country. And I think that the problem is that we don't have enough of the people explaining what landlessness has done to them, right? Let me just remind you that 98% of the people on the face of planet Earth do not own any land. All over. You mentioned other countries just now, so I'm going to do the same thing to you. 98% of the people who live on the planet do not and have not and will not ever own land. Are you then saying we should take that as a blanket statement? I'm not saying, no, I'm, no, no. I, it is a blanket okay. statement. It is true. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, way it's, that, it's not, it the it's way not ideal. Is. No, it's not ideal. But I said to you, here's a solution is start giving people title deeds for the, the land they have We're possessed definitely doing that. Yes. for generations. Definitely. Um, who, are your, who are your voters? Who do you think you're going to get? Young, old, rich, poor, this province, that province. Tell me what you're looking for. So we've got a whole array of voters. And I think the first voters understands all the people that are, are looking for employment. That's, that's really our first voters because we, we speak to their current need to say there will be things done practically. We're not just saying government will create jobs. They are steps that are going to be taken to create jobs. The second vote is also the parents. We've realized that a lot of parents are concerned about the future of their children in South Africa. So a lot of the parents are coming on board and also young people. Young people are also saying, look, we get it. We understand. We need somebody who we can challenge and talk to who is not going to come and talk like this to young people, but somebody <laughs> who will just come and talk their own accent, talk to them in the way they understand, debate them, engage them, and get... Or if you're Musi my money, depends which accent yeah, you switch on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because when you're in Stellenbosch, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know? <laughs> You've got to put it on. Never been, so... so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, so, so those, are, those are three voters, yeah. And... Have you got some funding or are you funding this all yourself? So I'm funding this all myself. Um, yeah, dude. And, hmm. and there are other South Africans that are, that are chipping in. It's expensive yeah. business, huh? It is. Very Politics. expensive, yeah. It Very really is. Yeah. So look, man, we, we, we've gone back and forth about a bunch of issues. But um, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, you become the president of this country after 29th of May. You've got 100 days ahead of you. Your first 100 days in office at the union buildings. What does that look like for South Africans in a real meaningful way? What does that look like? Look, I think it looks like a lot of shaking up, um, a lot of shaking up. So the first thing we need to do is define an agenda for the nation. So for me, it's vision sharing, mm -hmm. telling the nation, this is the vision we're going for and this is what we're doing. And anybody that stops the vision of the country is an enemy of the country. That's the first thing, right? Okay. So wh wh whatever that vision looks like, that's the vision that we're all following, right? The second thing is dealing with the crime situation. Um, a lot of stuff in this country don't function because of crime. Mm -hmm. So dealing with removing the police minister, removing a whole lot of red tape in the police system and adding a lot of tech in the police system to sort of check on everything to the point where we have systems that are, that are helping us with that. Empowering young entrepreneurs, making sure that we fund them. We fund people that already have businesses that are working. We sort of say, hey, here's money, promise us to create jobs you know, to people that are already creating jobs, right? And the, the third thing also is lowering tax incentives for international conglomerates. So sitting down with companies and saying, mm. guys, we're going to be unfair. You're a company in South Africa. Yes, we know you've been in South Africa. We don't really care about that. Listen, Toyota, 
If you can open, we are giving you a special economic zone where your tax is going to be tailored to a certain amount and we negotiate on that. And the third thing also is bringing a lot of capital into the country, making sure that we, we red tape a lot of, there's a lot of rich people who are uncomfortable about what the government can do with their money, telling them, hey, bring your money to South Africa. We'll protect you. Let's build factories. Let's create employment. Bring that money here and we'll grow that money with you. So ensuring that we take from Dubai, we take from the nations that people find as tax havens. Look, if we can shut down Switzerland, I'd be very happy. So a couple of people here with comments. Uh, some interesting things. Uh, yes, we do buy, do that by ownership. Uh, first getting the lion's share of the profit. And so, I'm not sure what Azalea is talking about there. Uh, <laughs> So let's just see here. Uh, this dude is well-meaning, but I wish him all the best, says Carl. Carl. Says you're naive, but well-meaning. Well, he wishes you, you well. Uh, so Slippery Pickle says Second Amendment's rights would go a long way. Protect the citizens, not the army. We don't have a Second Amendment in this country, yeah, just don't. to be clear. Yeah. Slippery Pickle. But I think what you mean is gun rights. Yep. Um, and then Yaku says, refreshing. This guy talks a lot of sense. So there's, uh, there's some fans in the in the crowd here. Yeah, they are. This is good. Uh, Miguel says, let me go and watch porn before this interview ends. <laughs> <laughs> so not everybody. Um, all right. I think we've we've touched on a lot of interesting things here. I thought that Jack's comment there about culture is very, very important because politics mm. comes after that. It doesn't it, come before that. It, right? it has to. It has to because when I look at things from the top down, right? If you hear that the president is hiding money in his couch that shouldn't be there. When you get pulled over by a Metro Police officer, <laughs> you're going to put money out of your little couch Sheesh. so that you don't get the <laughs> fine. You get what I mean? It's top down. I was telling a friend of mine the other day that South Africa started off on a trajectory unlike anything else on the planet. Think about it. In 1994, we have our first democratic elections. What happens in 95? We host the world Rugby World Cup. Yeah. Okay? Not only that, we win it. What happens the following, following year? All Africa Games, as well as the African Cup of Nations. We did well in both. Mm -hmm. The following year, what happens? We qualify for the uh, Soccer World Cup for the first time after readmittance. But look at what we've done with our breakfast since then. And we had, uh, let's not forget, mm. under the um, Becky administration, we had 6% growth rates. Uh, mm. I mean, look, look at what we've done. Do you think so, we can get that all right? Do you think we, we have the ability to fix these things? I definitely think so. I think, I think we've got big abilities. Look, I think as, as being an entrepreneur, I've, I've had opportunities to meet. And I remember there was once an investor that came and he was looking at investing in South Africa. And I was part of the delegation that showed him around and, and, you know, assisted. And we were told that this is a billionaire, right? Obviously, didn't check into the background and everything, mm -hmm. but we assisted, right? And when this billionaire was leaving, we were all at the airport, you know, and he was in high spirits, excited. I'm looking forward to doing this. And he held his pockets at our tumble and he said, where's my phone? Oh, no. The moment he said, where's my phone? All of us froze. Oh, all of Jesus. us that were there froze. We are now looking, where's your phone? And then we ask him and he says, somebody bumped into me, but I didn't take any, any liking to it. And oh. all of us as South Africans, we look down and we're like, somebody bumped into him, the phone is gone. Mm. And we're all waiting for what to say, you know? And, and one guy who's next to me says, look, we'll buy you a new phone because we're trying to improvise it. And he says, it's not about the new phone. It's about mm. the fact that that phone had so much information that it's not even backed up and he's now worked up, right? And he ends off by saying, Look, I can't work with a country I can't trust. Mm. He says, if people are going to steal my phone, they're going to steal my business, right? And he leaves. There's a lot of people that want to do business in South Africa, want to open up companies, that want to do things, but they just don't trust the country. They don't trust the leadership. They don't trust the way things are done. Mm. And for us, what we're trying to do is to say, if you want the country to grow, you need to create an environment for trust for those investors. And what that means is you need to create a, a, an environment where they feel comfortable to be able to invest. Sort of like a Dubai luring an environment where they feel, oh, my, my guard is off. Bring in all my money. Tell my right. banker to move all my money here. Let's do everything here. I want everything around me. Right? Well, it's interesting that you, I mean, first of all, I love that story because it, it does illustrate a, one of our big stumbling blocks. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not something we sit here and be ashamed of. It's something we must try and fix. Yeah. But I love that you have brought up Dubai a number of times because remember what Dubai was in 1994. It was a mm. little desert city with nothing going on. 
it was absolutely the backwater of the backwaters. Sure, they had oil money, but it was all just being used by the people who were at the very top and there was no real development going on. Yeah, mm. it was and Alexandra. Then, right, and mm. then suddenly they decided, okay, this is our trajectory. We're going to run out of oil at some point, so let's turn it into more than that. And they did. And with, with our country, it's almost like the opposite happened. Mm. We'll just keep doing what we always did, except the people who benefited from it will be a different group of crooked politicians to the previous group of who did the same thing. Politicians, right? yeah. So yeah. I think it's instructive that you brought up Dubai. And I, I do think that that last story of yours is a very powerful way for us to end it because I think it's an, an excellent thing for, for all of us to think about how, how we contribute to things being better or worse. Definitely. And Paul, I've got to tell you, like, dude, props to you. Yeah. You go out there and you change the world and, and, and make a difference. And if all your ideas don't work, that's cool. Mm. But at least you're out there making a difference. And you have decided to put your money where your mouth is, which I have respect for. So thank you for coming to see us. Yeah. And good luck. Thank I you hope, so much. I hope, and, you, and, I hope you get at least a seat in parliament. Yeah. Okay. And, shake and things up. Don't like, I, I like the fact that you came to sit down with us, even though we've kind of been assholes, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for hanging out, man. Those he did say he didn't want us to ask him what he had for breakfast. Yes. So we <laughs> yeah, it was fun. No, thank you, man. No, thanks, thanks so much. I enjoyed this. Thank Paul you. Dagada is, uh, is the, the guest this morning and his book is called I Am The Vision. It's a manifesto of his political party, there it Arise is. South Africa. You can find out more about them by just looking them up all over the socials and on the internet. You can find all the information that we didn't have a chance to get to this morning. Mpodagada, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. We will see you 